Yo, yo. <sighs> yo, ho, people in the chat already. 30 seconds deep. I wasn't even like prepared. Hello, comrades. Hello, Illinois State Fishing. Good morning, Revolution. Good morning. Hello, comrade Eddie. Hello, Jacob. Good to see you again. How's my guitar sounding, comrade? Banger. Well, thank you. Yo, yo. Eddie, what's your favorite black metal? What counts as black metal? Because I like metal music. I just don't know like what's death metal, what's black metal. Is there a difference between heavy metal and just metal? Um, I can name all of the metals on the periodic table. Just kidding, I can't. It's just ill, Eddie. No way, it's not Illinois. Ill, I-L-L. Dang, I'm sorry. I've been mispronouncing your name forever. I thought for sure it was Illinois. I don't know why I thought that. Sometimes I just read people's names in my head, and then that's what their name is in my head. And then I find out like a year later, I've been saying their name wrong. And I'm, it's just really hard to switch. <laughs> I did that with this person on TikTok named Dante. I thought their name was Dan. Called them Dan for a year. What do you identif politically identify as? Example, Marxist-Leninist. Um, Marxist-Leninist. <laughs> Thank you for providing that good example. Um, and also answering your own question. I mean, ILL does stand for Illinois, but you can say ILL for short. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. It's parenti time. That's enough guitar. Let's get serious. Just finished Washington Bullets. Came across it on your page. Thank you for the book recommendation. Awesome. What did you think of it? Washington Bullets is one of my favorites. Uh, one of my favorite books. I, I've said this before. I basically consider it an extension on Lenin's imperialism. Um, so Lenin said in imperialism, you know, basically laid out what the basis of imperialism is, the basis of capitalist imperialism um, being, you know, well, I guess the, the very basis is exploitation and the, the capitalist relation. Um, but then as the capitalists accumulate um, and, and capital concentrates into fewer and fewer hands, uh, you see the emergence of this financial oligarchy, banks and uh, giant manufacturers who n eventually um, spread capitalism and capture all of the markets at home. Um, so then they are forced to go abroad um, and exploit abroad, export capital abroad. Um, and Lenin basically lays out that basis. Um, and, and then Vijay expands on it because post World War II, especially, I mean, Lenin wrote imperialism in 1917, but then in like the forties, especially the late forties at the end of World War II, imperialism's face definitely changes. Um, there, we definitely need to update our analysis because the U S I mean, Europe and the Soviet union, um, have just 
experienced all, or had 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 all the fighting um, go on on their territory during World War II, and much of the infrastructure was destroyed, leaving the U.S. as this sort of um, uh, dominant emergent imperial power, especially after they dropped two nukes on Japan. Um, so you also at this time see the creation of the CIA in 1947, the IMF and the World Bank in, in 49, I believe, U.S. Special Forces around that time, uh, the formation of NATO um, in 1949, uh, the creation of all these different imperialist apparatuses, which allow the the U.S. to do things like enforce economic sanctions, you know, or, or set up military bases abroad and use drone warfare later on once the technology allowed it um, uh, to do all these these various different things um, that are, of course, you know, aimed at doing regime change, aimed at carrying out the economic interests of the imperialist bourgeois class at home, the exploiting class. Um, so what Washington Bullets does by Vijay is really updates Lenin's analysis and says, OK, here is all the, the new apparatuses of imperialism that have been set up um, since World War II. Here's how they operate. Here's their history. Here's what we know based on, you know, a lot of leaked CIA documents, for one. Um, so nobody has the fire that early Parenti had, uh, but Vijay is great. Yeah, Vijay's like... Uh, my dad heard him on the radio today and he asked me, he's like, have you ever heard of Vijay Prashad? I'm like, yes. And I was actually giving my dad black shirts and reds, a Parenti book when he brought up Vijay. And I'm like, those are like my two favorites. <laughs> hey, Eddie, did you watch today's UFC fights? Yes. Could you tell? Because I jumped on the live uh, right when the UFC fights got over. <laughs> it was sad. The, the biggest fight was the main fight on the card, which I postponed the live to watch was going, it was getting crazy. And then one of the guys dislocated his shoulder. Mecha tankies. <laughs> My only book that I have uh, by Parenti as of now is Black Shirts and Reds. Parenti's worst enemy is the mic. Black Shirts and Reds is this classic, but I guess that can be a good transition into what I wanted to talk about today or, or lecture about today which is Michael Parenti's The Assassination of Julius Caesar, a people's history of ancient Rome, a people's history. Um, so my my comrade Andy, who I need to have back on the show soon, actually I'll shoot him a text after this, um, got this signed by Parenti for me. So I'm now reading it because this has been on my reading list forever. I mean, I've wanted to read that book uh, for a long, long time just because I thought it seemed really interesting. And it is really interesting. It, it's basically as interesting as I thought it would be. And I'm learning the stuff that I hoped I would or drawing the parallels that I hoped I would. So let me pull this up. I actually have uh, some lecture notes here written out um, so I can talk about this um, in, a, in a more organized fashion than I usually do rather than just rambling. Um, but one of the things that Parenti breaks down in chapter two, we've talked about this book a lot, so I won't review um all of it uh but it's basically about the class system in rome um and and he's arguing uh that that rome had a class structure and many of the historians um who we use to study rome were from the bourgeois class or uh the aristocratic class or the slave owning land owning class and therefore that tinted their history tinted the way they portray caesar tinted the way they portray various events in rome um, so he's kind of going in and giving the people's history, uh, giving an alternative and, and criticizing a lot of these uh, historians like Cicero, who were slave owners and landowners and are now held up by um, Western historians. Um, so the myth that he goes into debunking in chapter, what chapter was it? Let me check. I don't want to get this wrong. In chapter two um, is the myth that slavery in Rome and slavery in the era of antiquity, which is usually considered to be um, 4,500 BC to like 450 CE or AD. Um, so that period in there, there's a myth that slavery during that period was not exploitative, not oppressive, um, didn't rely on racism in order to justify it. And, and actually the slaves, you know, just knew their place in society and they were friendly with their masters and their masters mostly treated them well. Um, and that's why Rome was able to flourish. Uh, this is the myth 
the myth that's perpetrated by folks like uh, um, the historian Cicero, uh, who's honored and, and you know, glorified um, among modern Western historians. Um, but he himself was a slave owner, you know, so of course he was going to uh, paint slavery during that time through rose colored glasses. Um, and he talked about the friendship that he had with his slaves, you know, um, never mentioning that the slaves were forced, you know, into that position and, and had to toil all day um, for very little as uh, the, the wealthiest in Roman society accumulated massive, massive amounts of wealth. Um, so many historians at the time owned slaves. Yeah. And, and me the reason that many of the historians like Cicero at the time um, were slave owners or were landowners, because that's the people who could afford to get educated. Those were the people who had the time to get educated. Those were the people who had the time to read and write. So, you know, they can paint slavery through these rose colored glasses and say that the slaves, you know, were just accepting of their position and didn't want to rise up against their exploitative masters. But the slave side of the story is never told, you know, the slaves history, the people's history is never told. We never get to hear what the, the slaves actually thought about this because they didn't know how to read and write because they were systematically excluded from education and, and from the ability to develop themselves intellectually. Um, so then we take the wealthiest of society, the histories written by them, those who were wealthy enough to read and write, um, and we act as if it's an unbiased history, right? As if Cicero is giving us some unbiased history and not a history from his class position, you know? So when he's talking about the friendship that he had with the slaves and how, you know, slaves were just friendly with their masters in Rome during this era, um, that's from his perspective, right? And there's vast evidence um, that that was not true, that, you know, slavery in Rome was extremely exploitative. It relied on torture. It relied on violence. Um, and, and the purpose of it was exploitation for the accumulation of mass wealth. Um, and, and this is something that happened in the American South as well. Uh, when the Civil War broke out, there are many recorded histories of Southern slave owners who freak, or who were stunned that their slaves either refused to work or ran away or joined the Union Army because they thought their slaves were there voluntarily. You know, they thought the slaves were their friends. Maybe the slaves treated the masters um, well because they knew they were under the threat of violence. But once the Civil War broke out, of course, they were going to fight for their freedom. And this was astonishing to some of the southern slave owners. You know, oh, we treated our slaves so well. You know, why would they want to be in, in horrible servitude under the threat of torture and, and death? Um so, yeah, you see this a, a similar thing in Rome where where the slave owners have this sort of uh, rosy picture of how the slaves feel about their exploitation. Um, and, and there are a lot of uh, parallels between um, between American Southern slavery and between the, the slavery that existed in Rome during the era of antiquity. Um, I'm trying to share my screen here so I can pull up the what I want to show y'all next. Um, and the reason that these parallels between slavery in Rome and slavery in the US are so interesting for me is because I've done a lot of research, um, basically in an attempt to give a dialectical materialist analysis of the US to apply Marx's method to the US and study our development. Um, I've done a lot of research into slavery and, and slavery's connection to capitalism, not only as, you know, the origins of capitalism's wealth, you know, and basically playing a foundational role both in European capitalism and northern capitalism in, the, in, in America, uh, but also just looking at the differences between slavery as a mode of production and, and capitalism as a mode of production, because, you know, of course, as Marxists, we have this is a simplified way to explain it, but there's an idea of base and superstructure. So the base is production, how things are produced and the relations of production. So slave relations and, and wage labor relations are different. Um, so there are different social institutions which stem from that, different cultural norms which stem from that, different forms of, of the state and, and armed bodies of the state. Um, so that's a lot of what I looked at in this article, which I'll just copy and paste in the chat for y'all. Um, it's one of my favorite articles I've written. It's been published um, in a handful of really cool places. Um, not to brag, but just to point that out because it's good. Um, but
Uh, so yeah, slavery is is a different mode of production to capitalism. Um, and in that article, I analyze slavery as you know sort of the originator of a lot of capitalism's wealth. You know, the Western um, capitalist class that was emerging both in England at the time and the Northern United States was heavily reliant on cotton. Uh, they really enjoyed access to this cheap cotton market. Um, they were largely textile capitalists who were were pushing out, you know, clothes and blankets and, and things that, that needed cotton to be created. Um, so Southern slavery played a foundational role um, in Northern capitalism and European capitalism, even though the, the slave owning class, the plantation owners in the South were eventually drawn into a conflict with the, the Northern capitalists. Um, but yeah, so, so some of the different forms of uh, society or some of the different institutions that you see both in our, or just different cultural norms that were seen both in the era of Roman slavery and in the era of American Southern slavery. Um, some of the things you see stemming from that mode of production and from the slave relation. Um, you have brigades that are formed to catch runaway slaves. That was a thing both in Rome and in um, and in the Southern U.S. So it's sort of like a form of police. Uh, but existing under, you know, a slave mode of production. So what the, the main role of police, even in a capitalist society, is to protect private property, uh, make sure private property isn't damaged, protect the capitalist private property. Obviously, in the U.S., we have, you know, a militarized police force that also serves the prison industrial complex. But um, uh, mainly, you know, what the police do is is protect private property. And in a slave society, slaves are considered private property. So if a slave runs away, you know, the job of the state, um, the state that's controlled by the slaving oligarchic class uh, is to catch those slaves and bring them back, bring back the property. Um, uh, in the southern south, in the southern U.S. under slavery and in Rome, you have torture uh, used as a way to motivate people to work. Um, under capitalism, you're motivated to sell your labor power under threat of slavery. I'm mean, sorry, under threat of starvation. Um, wage slaves are forced to sell their labor to a capitalist uh, in return for a wage or a salary, or else they won't be able to buy food or their means of subsistence, and they'll die. Um, under slavery, uh, because the slaves were owned by the capitalists, the capitalists had to feed them and had to take care of them. Otherwise, you know, the slaves would wither away, and the capitalists wouldn't have any labor power. Um, so in order to make the slaves work harder and harder and harder, um, they use torture and, and different forms of torture. Um, and actually what Edward Baptist points out in his book, the half has never been told about the Southern U S is that there was a long period of time where there weren't that many innovations in, in cotton harvesting or, um, uh, there was the cotton gin that allowed for, you know, more cotton to be used. Uh, but there weren't that many innovations in the actual picking of cotton. Um, so the cotton gin actually created, you know, uh, the impulse for more labor, more picking of cotton. And the picking of cotton, the actual rate at which cotton was picked went up every single year um, in the American South, even when there were no technological advancements in the picking of cotton. Because the slave owners were refining and getting better at torturing the slaves into working hard. Um so and, and that's something that you also see in in the Roman system of slavery, torture in order to force them into working. Um, the slaves obviously had very few human or political rights uh, in, in the southern U.S. as well as Rome. You had um, mass sexual exploitation of the slaves. Um, racism was used in both societies to perpetrate the class systems. Remember, in Rome. Uh, they used a lot of like criminals and also um, former, I mean, like captives of war um, as their, as their slaves, but Rome was constantly expanding, right? So they were constantly going into other territories and other land where people looked different and acted different, had different cultures, and then, you know, capturing those people and subjecting them to slavery. So of course, racism naturally emerged as a way to say, you know, no, this system is justified. You know, we're just, we're just enslaving the barbarians who aren't as civilized as us Romans or whatever else. Um, and then something interesting, uh, and, and this hits on the fact that capitalism and slavery are distinct, different modes of production. Uh, they are a distinctly different uh, relation um, between uh, labor and owner. Uh, both societies 
uh, Rome and, and the American Southern uh, Slave Society used wage labor for riskier jobs. So there was a class of wage laborers that existed selling their labor to capitalists or, or aristocrats or whoever else um, to do jobs for them. And the slave owners would hire those wage laborers for the risky jobs because they didn't want to risk their slaves because they looked at their slaves as property, right? Now, this is not to say that the slaves had it good or that the slaves had it better than wage laborers. Because I said this in a book a book club one time, and somebody got mad at me and said I was uh, being insensitive by suggesting that the wage laborers had it worse than the slaves. No, that's not what I'm saying. You know, but to do a material analysis of these societies, we need to look at the role that the slaves played and and that the wage laborers played. And look at, you know, the different way in which the ruling class looked at slaves rather than looked at wage laborers. You know, they looked at wage laborers as disposable. Um, they only, you know, need to they only need the wage laborers for whatever period during the day that they're paying them versus the capitalists had some incentive, despite the fact that they tortured and beat and psych psychologically abused their slaves. Um, they had to keep them alive, right? And they had to keep them somewhat strong. So if there were like risky or deadly jobs, they would hire the poor wage laborers. Um, so the entire underclass um, in, in Rome and in um, the American South was exploited and was hurt by this system of slavery, um, was pushed into worse conditions by the system of slavery, which is why you have, you know, a ton of uh, the masses joined the Union Army when the Civil War breaks out, including white wage laborers who were tired of these conditions and hated the, the plantation oligarchy. Um, and then Rome, of course, you know, they say it fell apart because of uprisings everywhere. You know, many of these were class uprisings, um, which is something that Parenti points out because people did, in fact, you know, hate the, the system of oppression and the system of slavery that they were subjected to. Um, so, yeah, that's what I read today. Um Michael Parenti's The Assassination of Julius Caesar, A People's History of Ancient Rome, uh, was the source, as well as uh, my own article about American slavery and global capitalism. And yeah, there's my little lecture about, about different modes of production um, and different class th societies throughout history. Uh, today, we hit on three, basically three modes of production. Two are very similar. I mean, two are, are basically the same. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll go with very similar. Two are very similar. Um, but we have slavery in antiquity, you know, the kind of slavery that existed in Rome. Uh, we had the uh, Chattel slavery of the U.S., which existed alongside capitalist markets in um, uh, Europe and um, the northern United States. And then we looked at the global capitalism of today um, and compared all of these. So, yeah, pretty cool stuff. Um, yeah, I enjoyed talking about that with you all. Um, I want to start out most streams with like a little mini lecture, you know, um, just go through what I've been reading, what I've been thinking about it. Um, yeah, it's fun. Chattel slaves were a form of capital. Yeah, that's basically how it, the difference is like, and, and this is where someone got mad at me and said I was being insensitive or actually said I was being racist because I said that, you know, under slavery, uh, the laborers are commodified. Under capitalism, their labor power is commodified. So under capitalism, you sell your labor power to a capitalist for a certain part of the day. You know, under slavery, the slave is considered itself, you know, the person th themselves is considered to be the property of that capitalist, a commodity which can be bought and sold in a market. Um, uh, and that's not to say that that's true. That's not to say people are, are commodities or, you know, that that slaves are inhuman. That's to say that's how this mode of production operated. Um, and there's many examples. If you look at at um, the history of Southern slavery, you know, where they tried to treat people like commodities um, and it just didn't work because people rebelled, you know, or the slaves found ways to rebel or maintain their culture, or maintain, you know, their uh, various practices or may you know share their own history with each other educate each other you know they fought back against all these attempts to commodify them and just make them you know um a, a, an unthinking labor force it's impossible because you can't do that with people with human beings um they're always going to rise up out of our oppressive conditions hey eddie I know this is off topic, but have you made a video about Salvador Allende before? I'm interested in learning about him. That's not that off topic. 
Um, some of my very first videos on TikTok were about Salvador Allende. Those are all gone now because TikTok deleted my account. Uh, <laughs> and I didn't back, them up, back up my videos like a dummy, which I'm still not doing. I'm still not bagging up videos on the new account. I'm going to lose them again, probably. Um, but... Yeah, Salvador Allende um, was a socialist leader in Chile. Um, he took power in the 70s. He actually ran, that was when he won election. That was the third time he had run. Um, the first two elections were basically thwarted by the CIA, but barely. Uh, Allende almost won despite mass um, uh, election interference from the U.S. as well as the bourgeois class in Chile. Um so Allende had all these ideas for development. Um, he was an anti-imperialist, basically advocating just basic socialism. The same thing, you know, advocating being allied with Cuba um, and, and the Soviet Union. Uh, basically just Marxism, uh, a, a Marxist-Leninist uh, running for the highest office in his country via election was basically what Salvador Allende was. Uh, except he wasn't technically a Leninist because, um, you know, there there was no revolutionary struggle. Um, and the Chilean people were not armed and organized and prepared for what would come next. Um, so after Allende took power and during his rise to power, Fidel Castro was saying, you need to arm the revolution. Right. You need to be ready for the U.S. to come after you. Uh, there's no taking power in a bourgeois society, in a capitalist society, especially especially a global imperialist capitalist society. Um, there's no taking power peacefully via the elections, not because we want to be violent, but because the U.S. is going to attack you because the capitalist imperialists are going to come for you. Um, and Fidel was exactly right. Uh, the CIA did a coup um, overthrowing Allende uh, and killing him. It was a very violent coup. Um, and the violence continued because the person the U.S. put in power, as well as the U.K. and Margaret Thatcher, was Augusto Pinochet. And Augusto Pinochet is one of, or was one of the most tyrannical dictators in Latin America's history, which is really saying something because um, the U.S. has backed some horrific dictators in, throughout Latin America's history all over the continent. Um, but Pinochet was especially brutal. He, um, one of the, the first things he did was kill 10,000 Chilean leftists and socialists in Chile, Chile's national soccer stadium. The U.S. would give him lists of people who they suspected to have left wing leanings or be involved in working class organization. Um, and Pinochet would have them killed and tortured. Uh, Pinochet, as well as other Latin American dictators, were trained up in the CIA uh, in the torture techniques that the CIA had. CIA had developed um, in their testing uh, during MK Ultra, Project MK Ultra. Um, Operation Condor saw all the Latin American dictators, including Pinochet, trained up in these these torture techniques um, from MK Ultra. Um, yeah, Pinochet would rule like an iron fist. And not only that, but his economic advisor was Milton Friedman, as well as a, a bunch of other Chicago boys trained up in in right wing Friedmanite neoliberal economics. And that's why Chile is known as the lab of neoliberalism. Um, it was the first place where really the entire entire social safety net was sold off. Everything was privatized um, and, and Chile became a complete trickle down neoliberal country. Um, now, the the neolibs and the libertarians will still look at this, you know, they'll look back at this and say um, this was the best time in Chile's history. It was an economic miracle. They'll call it the Chilean miracle. All right, this has been debunked by every scholar who has even a grain of skepticism. Um, unemployment in Chile shot up to like 15 to 20 percent. Milk was taken out of the, the schools, free milk programs. Uh, malnutrition went up. Um, life expectancy went down. Pretty much every standard of living for the masses got worse. Now, there were a handful of corporations who were able to enrich themselves. A handful of transnational corporations uh, had their profits go way up because they were able to more thoroughly exploit uh, the Bolivian, I mean, sorry, the Chilean resources and the Chilean people and their labor. Um, and, and that is what the right wing economists and the Friedmanite economists will point to and say, look, you know, this was a miracle. The Chilean miracle was a good thing because these corporations made all this money while meanwhile ignoring, you know, the horrible effects that it had on the masses of Chilean society. Um, so the U.S. basically took a democratically elected leader in Allende, a democratically elected socialist with a, a mind for development and replaced them with a tyrannical dictator um, who had a 
um, I don't know how you describe Milton Friedman, an economic terrorist, uh, basically come in and pillage the pillage the Chilean economy. And later, Pinochet would renationalize some of the industry and he would re re implement some of the social programs because the policies of Margaret Thatcher and, and Milton Friedman uh, that they had suggested to him and that the IMF and World Bank had told them to go through with um, had been terrible. Um, oh, and, and one more thing, uh, one more factor. After Allende was elected, uh, Richard Nixon famously said, make their economy scream, uh, which shows how the U.S. uses economic warfare and, and financial sanctions and things like this to attack countries. Um, and that was really emerging as a strategy of the U.S. at this time, you know, like 20 years after um, the, the IMF and the World Bank had been formed, which we were talking about earlier in the show. Um, so they sanctioned Allende and uh, the IMF and the World Bank, which are the two, you know, glo major global financial institutions, which are backed by the U.S., created after World War II. Again, something we talked about earlier. Um, they went from giving Chile something like it was like two hundred million dollars a year in financing to two. So they went from two hundred million to two and then sanctioned the country to, to make the economy scream. Um, just showing how the U.S. uses financial warfare to attack any socialist system any alternative system. Um, and it's hilarious. We talk about, you know, the U S talks about and the UK about, you know, defending democracy. I guess that's more of a U.S. thing than a UK thing, but the U S talks about spreading democracy and defending democracy. And then when a, a socialist is democratically elected, they go in and torture and kill all the socialists and uh, put a tyrannical dictator in power who allows transnationals to pillage the economy. That sounds like the real dictatorship to me, fellas. The murderous experiments of the Chicago boys, yes, and the Berkeley boys. There was basically the same thing as the Chicago boys, These this group of hotshot economists who ruined the Chilean economy. Um, there was one in Indonesia called the Berkeley boys. It was just the same thing. <laughs> Bolton recently admitted to orchestrating coups, yes. I, I made a TikTok about that. Like, he's talking about, and, and what the funniest part about it, because I'm not even surprised about this with John Bolton. He is like one of the most proud neocons to ever live. Oh, so I'm not surprised my, he said that. My God. So I opened TikTok and it was annoying me. Um, I'm not surprised John Bolton said that, but. It's just funny because the interviewer was saying, you know, you don't need to be a genius to do a coup. And John Bolton's like, oh, yes, you do. You know, I had to do a coup and, you know, I've orchestrated coups and I'm a genius. And it's like you guys supported freaking Juan Guaido, the international laughing stock who got pelted with chairs at his, his last campaign event. Juan Guaido literally supported a coup. Um, perpetrated by a U.S. based security firm where some of the people attempting the coup had airsoft guns. They didn't have real guns. They had airsoft guns and they were captured by Venezuelan fishermen before they hit land. Let's uh, <laughs> let's just check this out. Let's just watch the TikTok. All due respect, uh, one doesn't have to be brilliant to attempt a coup uh, i disagree with that as somebody who has helped plan coup d'etat yeah not here but you know other places bruh you are the people who dumped 52 million dollars into juan guaido the international lol cow this is the guy who backed a failed coup attempt where some of the people literally had airsoft guns and they were captured by venezuelan fishermen before they even reached the land here's guaido getting absolutely destroyed by chairs at his own political rally Jeez Louise. Yeah, only the most sophisticated geniuses who the U.S. State Department and the CIA choose to back. And also, if you're surprised that John Bolton admitted to planning coups, uh, you haven't been following John Bolton's political career. This guy's entire purpose in life is creating more war and overthrowing foreign governments. This is the guy who openly declared he wanted to follow the Libya model for North Korea. Libya being the country who the U.S. destroyed and threw into a civil war and political disaster. But with all due respect, uh, one...
Sorry, I said basically everything I have to say about John Bolton's interview in that TikTok. Like, I'm not surprised John Bolton said that because he's a neocon and he literally said, you know, open North Korea was talking about, you know, denuclearizing, getting rid of their nukes. And Bolton was like, yeah, we're going to follow the Libya model, which, of course, Libya was overthrown and Gaddafi was brutally killed in the countries in a civil war with basically no central government and a complete economic and political disaster now after formerly being a, a stable and prosperous country, one of the most prosperous in Africa. He openly said, that's what we're going to do to North Korea. Give us your nukes now. Like, he is just a bold-faced and pretty stupid neocon. Um, so, yeah. Uh, what was I going to grab? I thought I had some. I don't remember what I was going to do. But. Are you Americans and Marxists? Yes. That format with your head coming in from different directions is fire. Thank you. Thank you. I try, you know. Dang it. I had something I wanted to talk about or say, and I, it completely slipped my mind. Was it in the comments? Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember what I was going to grab. I was going to go back here and grab um, a book. Naomi Klein describes uh, Pinochet or Friedman as a capitalist fundamentalist. Are you talking about Friedman and the Chicago Boys? Um, probably. Um, cause it, but that could describe Pinochet too, I guess. But Pinochet's economic ideas were less strong than the U.S.'s. Um, but uh, this comment also says, I swear I read this chapter of Shock Doctrine this afternoon. Ha <laughs> ha, it's awesome. And... This is what I wanted to grab. Naomi Klein's Shock Doctrine is a good book. This book is anti-communist. Uh, it compares Marxists to fundamentalist Christians waiting for the revelation. Um, so obviously not a book I you know give 100% endorsement or agreement of. But this has great information about you know the U.S.'s shock therapy. Um, how they basically plunder these countries' economies um, uh, using neoliberal shock therapy and, and goes over the results of this, you know, including in, in former socialist countries, how these countries were thrown into economic disasters during the fall of the Soviet Union, which uh, we'll talk about a little more in depth later. Um, but yeah, great book, goes in detail about the U.S. coups, goes in detail about Operation Condor. And one of my favorite parts about that book is it goes in depth about MK Ultra. So the CIA's torture techniques and their torture programs, how they developed them. Um, well, they were intended to be brainwashing programs, but uh, the CIA figured out that they couldn't really brainwash anybody. They could only wipe out their brains, you know, give them psychological damage and induce psychosis via drugging them and, and torturing them and uh, doing different forms of psychological and physical torture. Um, so then after they had created all those, um, uh, or, you know, um, gone through with that uh, research, that horrible torture research, they gained some conclusions from it and developed a, a torture program, uh, basically a, a way to torture people and, and, you know, stop people from being leftists, find communists, socialists, people with left wing ideas, ideas about revolution and, and torture it out of them. Um, and they they trained the Argentinian military junta in this. They trained up uh, Hugo Bonser in Bolivia in these techniques. They trained up Augusto Pinochet in these techniques all across the southern cone of, of Latin America. Um, and then the CIA would give Latin American dictators and the, the military leaders these kill lists of, of people to hunt down, uh, people who were suspected of having left wing sympathies. And then they would torture them with the CIA techniques. And Naomi Klein draws... Really good connection between MK Ultra and um, and Operation Condor. Talks about how those torture techniques were developed, and you know the effect that that had on the people who were subjected to program MK Ultra, and then how MK Ultra was used to torture torture the leftism and the revolutionary spirit out of Latin America. Giga Ched Eddie, not gonna lie. Thank you. We're trying out here. Need to read John Perkins. Okay. 
Friedman is the economic fundamentalist. Yeah, I would, ex I would, that's a great explanation of what he is. Um, and Naomi Klein is obviously a social Democrat, you know, she supports capitalist reforms. Um, so it makes sense for her to look at someone like Milton Friedman and be like, you're crazy. You know, you have to at least reform capitalism. You know, maybe I'm not a Marxist, but you have to at least reform it. Uh, Milton Friedman is just like, no, capitalism is the best system ever. The problem is actually government safety nets, you know, and any government intervention, um, even if it's government intervention to feed people and help people um, with the, the things that the market doesn't take care of. Um, we need to get rid of those things. They're actually bad is the Friedmanite policy. And, you know, that's not based on an analysis of reality. Right. Or it is, but it's based on what the capitalists want, what the bourgeois class wants, what the ruling political class in the U.S. wants, um, what Milton Friedman's donors and the people who allow him to be an academic superstar want. Um, so, you know, there's no base. It Everything's working backwards from that conclusion then. Right. There's no basis in reality. They don't look at Chile and see the the mass unemployment increase and malnutrition increase and decreases in literacy rates that happened when Augusto Pinochet was put in power and neoliberal economics were instituted, right? They just see that their profits went up, corporate profits, and they go, oh, it's an economic miracle. This is great. You know, Milton Friedmanite economics work again. And then if you try and complain, if you say, you know, people are starving, people are unemployed, kids are, are not getting educated anymore. They'll say, oh, we just need to trust the market. You know, if we if we do any interventions, that'll mess with the free hand of the market, which will produce the best thing for everyone. Trust us. It's like, no, you dumbasses. It's just producing, you know, what you want, which is a lot of profit and a lot of exploitation. Um, but, you know, they'll they'll use this dogmatic adherence to the market, this dogmatic adherence to the invisible hand. Um, and they'll just call it economics. They'll be like, you don't understand economics. You know, you have to blindly trust in the market and never suggest changing it or never suggest enacting social programs or changing society at all. Or you don't trust the market um, and, and they gaslight people. <laughs> and that's why economics is a bourgeois right wing science. Um, and that's why Marx was right. John Perkins economic hitman is OK. I've heard that it's pretty decent. What are some good books on economics, Eddie? Capital. You have to read Capital. Sorry. If you want to... So I, I studied economics um, at... And one of my economics professors was a Keynesian, sort of like a social democrat. And the other professor was the head of our local GOP and runs for office as a Republican every year. And they were a Milton Friedmanite, right wing, trickle down, um, Chicago boy style economist. Um, absolute dogmatic adherence to the invisible hand. Everything I was saying before about working backwards from their conclusion and designing society, you know, based around the invisible hand without ever having to prove this idea that the invisible hand is actually what's best for everyone. Um, that is that is this professor uh, to a T. Um, and now not only after reading Capital thoroughly, not only can I go back and help kids with that economics homework, which is really hard and whip through it easily um, because of what I know from reading Marx, um, I can criticize economic theory, right? I can I could go back into that class and I could argue with my teacher for hours and I believe that I would be right uh, because of what I've read in Capital. And, and, you know, Marx was so heavily plagiarized by economists during his time because he figured so much out. Right. He, he took the work of former economists and, and brought them to so many conclusions, worked out what was wrong. Um, and he does this all in Capital Volumes one through three. Um, so the economists after Marx were like, OK, we're still bourgeois economists. You know, we're still serving the capitalist class. We're not going to say Marx was right and socialism is the future. But we just have to steal everything that he figured out for us in terms of the science of economics. Uh, now, since then, that was classical economics. Neoclassical economics has emerged since then. Um, folks like Milton Friedman, Friedrich Hayek, and they've raised new, new-ish um, attacks against Marx, but not really. All, <laughs> pretty much every new attack that that has been raised against Marx, if you read Marx thoroughly enough, you'll find a spot where he uh, refuted it. Um, so really, capital is, is all you need. Um, and then imperialism by Lenin is also a necessary text. Um, 
those are the two I would check out. But then you could check out Michael Hudson. He's a great modern economist if you want an idea of the, the modern global economy. Um, Michael Hudson's got a really good article called, um, let me see here. I recommended this to a libertarian the other day. I don't know if they read it. Um, I saw them Googling it though. So maybe they read part of it. I hope so. So this is from Michael Hudson. who's a really good modern economist. I don't know what his background is. I don't think he's a socialist or anything, but, um, America, maybe he is a socialist, honestly, but he says America's neoliberal financialization policy versus China's industrial socialism. This is a really good economic, just a short write up um, about the current state of the global economy. Uh, everything's manufactured in China um, because they've been investing in production and in their real economy, developing their productive base uh, for the last 70 years and using the Belt and Road Initiative to, to develop productive capacities among all their allies, building up all their allies as trade partners. Um, meanwhile, the U.S. has been deindustrialized. Many of our manufacturing and extraction jobs have been outsourced to places where capitalists feel like they can uh, get cheaper labor to exploit. Uh, many of the most powerful capitalists in our um, in our society are bankers or, or capitalists who own wide swaths of real estate. Um, there's very little that's actually produced in the U.S. Much of our economy is is in the cloud. You know, it, it's tech based, it's finance based, it's uh, debt based. Um, so we have very little productive economy. And this just shows the difference between socialism and capitalism. Uh, capitalism and imperialism are in decay, uh, as reflected in the U.S. economy and the state of class struggle in the U.S. masses. Um, and China is on the rise. Um, they're producing more and more. Their economy is rising. Their allies are um, their allies are as well, thanks to the Belt and Road Initiative, largely. Um, and they produce everything, you know. So if there was some kind of economic crisis uh or some sort of like massive food shortage globally the u.s would be in a lot of trouble because we don't produce that much although we could you know we need to increase agricultural production stuff like that family farms are going under every day um but china would be all right because that's where everything is actually produced um but capitalism creates this illusion right creates this illusion that it's money that we want it's exchange value that we want you know, money is the universal equivalent. Money buys all other commodities. So we don't need to produce any actual commodities. You know, all we need is money. Um, and, and that's what the U.S. has become. A uh, society of, of the masses who are toiling in, in service industry jobs or um, non-organized jobs mostly. Um, while we have this giant parasitic oligarchic class of bankers and financiers, um, who, who dominate society and increasingly uh, expand their wealth, as in their, their money. Um, but they're not expanding the actual productive capacity of American society. They're still outsourcing those kind of jobs and buying up farmland. I've read a lecture by Michael Hudson on my channel. Oh, very cool. Yeah, he's great. He is great. Here's a John Green crash course video about the Bolshevik Revolution. Ooh, interesting. Yeah, I will add that to the list. I will add it right now. Thank you, Jacob. Marx married a woman from the nobility. His motive is to use the working class to bring down capitalism so the academics can take over. <laughs> I don't think that's true because Marx was a lot smarter than all the academics of his era. Um, but instead of writing stuff that made him rich, uh, he, he remained poor and on the run. Um, and Jenny, Marx's wife, was from the nobility and her family was very upset about her marrying Marx, marrying this radical or marrying this person who wasn't of status, didn't have money, didn't have wealth and power. And, and instead, you know, because Jenny loved Marx, uh, she lived with him in, you know, relatively poor conditions. Uh, so Marx could chase his dream. 
rather than, you know, marrying some aristocrat and just living a bourgeois life of pleasure. So that sounds like true love, if you ask me. Um, Eric Prince in Blackwater also did counterinsurgency in Xinjiang, just like he did in Iraq and Afghanistan for America. That guy just shows up wherever political violence is needed. No way. I did not know that. Do you have a source on that? Um, cause that is interesting. I mean, I believe it like the, the ETIM in Xinjiang, China, the sort of radical extremist group who the U S took off the list of terrorist groups when they wanted to start destabilizing China more in that region. Um, a lot of their guns and a lot of their weapons, uh, are still around from when the U S was funneling guns and weapons into the Mujahideen. You know, they could even be considered in some ways a splinter group of, uh, bin Laden's Mujahideen. Um, who the U.S. gave a bunch of arms and money to fight the um, the Soviet Union and fight the Marxist democratic government that wanted to create social reform and economic independence in Afghanistan. Hi, did you shave your head? No, I just cut it. Cut my hair. It's growing. It'll be back. Didn't Jenny's family also like the fact that, did not like the fact that Marx came from Jewish heritage? Probably. I mean, anti-Semitism was huge during Marx's day. Um, and Marx was Jewish, so. What is all this talk about primates and genomes in the chat? I'm so confused. Um, I'm just fine, but our previous engineers determined that humanity is only to, what are technocracy movement i've never heard of that chairman meow sorry did Deng destroy socialism in china was china better off under him or mao great question thank you um so i don't like necessarily the comparison of Deng to mao because it doesn't make that much sense um Deng and mao had different ideas uh Deng was exiled twice during the cultural revolution um, Deng favored a more Leninist, uh, style NEP, Lenin's new economic policy, um, which would allow for more markets, right? Which would allow, um, for more private markets, um, and basically a little bit more capitalism. Um, Mao was more of a Stalinist. He wanted more of the, the top down sort of Stalinist, um, economic system that was seen in world war II that the Soviet union used to industrialize, collectivize agriculture and defeat the Yahtzees. Um, not to say Lenin and Stalin butted heads on those, those issues, but you know, under Lenin, the NEP was enacted. And then under Stalin wartime communism necessitated more top down control. So China at first was more top down control. Um, the, uh, the main goal was industrialization and the creation of steel and, and teaching the Chinese people how to use and make steel. Cause you got to remember, you know, this was a semi-feudal agrarian country. These were peasants who only knew how to work the land. Um, they didn't know how to do steel and manufacturing and, and things like this. So all those things had to be taught to the people. They had to learn these skills um, and they had to use the agricultural surplus that was created um, in order to invest in industry um, and expand the cities um, and, and basically build up their infrastructure. So after that, after 20 years of, of construction under Mao and industrialization, that's when Deng Xiaoping comes in and opens up, you know, to, to more private markets, goes with a more Leninist style NEP policy. Um, and, you know, this didn't destroy socialism. It strengthened it. It deepened socialism. This has allowed China's um, poverty alleviation programs and, you know, yes, there have been things like increases in, in corruption because of the capitalists, you know, and, and increases in bourgeois mindset among the people, you know, increases in consumerism. Um, but these are things that Deng Xiaoping and the Chinese people knew were going to happen when they opened up, right? Because they understand how markets work. They don't have this naive, dogmatic adherence to the invisible hand in the market like American economists. They know how the invisible hand works. And they said, we're going to control the invisible hand and all the terrible things markets do with the visible hand of, of economic planning and, and of socialism. Um, and, and that system would not be impossible without the basis that was first laid under Mao. Um, so, so Deng Xiaoping and Mao go hand in hand and, and they didn't destroy socialism, but Deng actually deepened what Mao did. Um, and even though, you know, they had disagreements, they did have debates and they had different, you know, ideas on, on how to construct socialism. 
um, the policies of Mao, the, the 20 years or whatever of construction under Mao uh, made the economic policies of Deng possible. Um, and I'll pull up a video. One second here, Midwestern Marks video. This is a video I did all about that. Called Imperialism and the Construction grows. of Modern China, uh, featuring artsy Marxists. So this talks about Deng, Mao, the difference in their economic policies, and, and how it's led to the creation of modern China. Wow, is that a $50 super chat? Oh my goodness. $50 super sticker from Kate. Thank you so much. Oh my, holy crap. Y'all are so generous. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, Carlos... Not to give a sob story, but uh, I mean, it's not a sob story. It's a, a good story. Um, but Carlo, actually, I don't even know if I should say this. I'll save it for later. Yeah, I'll save it for later. Um, but I'll just say me and Carlos really, really, really appreciate your support. Um, we appreciate the fact that we can do this um, and it doesn't cost us money. You know, we can uh, take the money you give us, uh, and reinvest it in producing more videos, you know, keeping our equipment up to date, um, and then supporting ourselves in some ways, right? Like we both, Carlos and I both have other jobs, uh, attached to the academy, coaching, teaching. Um, but you know, this, our Midwestern Marks does help, uh, help support us, even if it's just a little bit. So you all are keeping us alive, keeping the work coming, keeping the education coming. Um, thank you very much. We, at this point in our lives as young, broke 20 year olds, um, chasing the uh, dream of revolution and revolutionary organization and education, not the dream, but trying to bring that into practice as much as we can while we're young and have a lot of energy. Um, yeah, we really appreciate your support, even if it's, or uh, we, we appreciate any support. And then financial support is just like, Man, people are struggling. People are working hard, and and they're still willing to you know send us a few bucks to get us to keep doing what we're doing. Really appreciate it. Kind of blows my mind um, that people are willing to do that. But much love for y'all. Yugoslavia was socialist, even if Tito stabbed the USSR in the back. Facts, Roscoe Dash. China is building AI, AI supercomputers. China's doing everything. <laughs> They're kicking our butts, y'all. They're making so many advances in science. Um, and uh, in, in, in nuclear technology, I'm looking at some of them right now. Um, the IAE is warning that, you know, Russian and Chinese designs are, are dominating nuclear reactors. It's because they have a better society. They educate their people better. They produce in a more rational way. Well, at least China and, you know, Russia could move in that direction. And they have, you know, moved in that direction materially a little bit under Putin. Um, but, you know, Russia and China have a more planned economy, a more rational economy. Um, that's what, why Putin is so popular. He nationalized some of the major Russian companies and, and reinvested them in Russia. Economic planning. Um and this is why they're kicking our butt and things like this. And the IAE is warning about this, but I'd rather have, you know, China and Russia have nuclear capabilities than the U.S. The U.S. is the only country who dropped an atomic bomb on two civilian cities, the only country to drop a nuke ever. Um, the U.S. is the country threatening um, to bring us closer to nuclear warfare every day with the conflict in Russia and Ukraine, really. Um, I, I pretty much trust that China is going to use their... Um, nuclear reactors for energy and for scientific purposes cannot say the same of the u.s and it's like carlos has been studying china a lot lately um they apply contradiction analysis in every field of of society and in every field of study contradiction analysis meaning like dialectical materialism basically marxism which is you know carlos and i have talked about this a lot once you read marx you know it's a philosophy it's it's dialectical materialism is a lens for looking at society looking at politics and looking at history 
Um, so it's, it's philosophy is sort of a discussion of how to think, you know, how do we think, how do we analyze things? How do we engage with arguments and, and other people's arguments? Um, how do we engage with politics? Um, and once you read Marx's theory of dialectical materialism, other fields start to make more sense, right? The way that you think about other things starts to change because you're thinking about how you think, you know? So for me, I studied political science and the history of imperialism for four years in college. Um, and once I learned Marxism, it, it really helped me expand my understanding of why imperialism was happening, why the U.S. was doing this, why exploitation and the, the relation between capitalists and wage labor is what, what drives capitalist imperialism, ultimately. Um, and, you know, China's doing this in, in you know, every field. Uh, so another example is, is education. So one of the if you study educational psychology in the united states in a capitalist country one of the main thinkers that they're going to teach you is lev vygotsky um lev vygotsky was a a soviet psychologist and he had a lot of revolutionary ideas about education about tailoring the education to people's strengths including the strengths of disabled people um, he was the first to criticize one of the first to criti criticize the ableist education system um, and he also developed some very foundational things, um, for the field of educational psychology that are basically universally recognized now. Those are what are taught in, in Western school systems. And the, the whole revolutionary character of his teachings are ripped out, right? They rip out these parts about, um, ableism and capitalist education and, and tailoring the education system to people's strengths and, you know, the failures of capitalist education, when Lev Vygotsky is taught in the U.S., that's never talked about. They just take the educational character out of everything he wrote. They take the dialectical materialist analysis of education and educational psychology out of Vygotsky and just leave the most bland, you know, basic principles. So one, this makes, you know, American education really bland and sort of unentertaining. If you're just learning these facts for the sake of learning facts, there, there really seems to be no purpose to it, um, no connection between them. Um, which is what dialectics gives us. And then, you know, it, it, it creates a bulwark. It, it stops us from doing a thorough and science, fully scientific analysis. Um, it, it impedes our thinking with dogmas, which dialectical materialism um, rips apart. And we did a podcast um, on Vygotsky, which is something I'm really proud of because... That's something I talk about a lot, how capitalism impedes every field of study and stops us from being smart. <laughs> um, that's funny that this is the video that popped up. Uh, look at that clickbait right there. So we talked with Curry Mallet basically about from the Liberation School, which is attached to PSL. Um, for those who don't know, shout out PSL and the Liberation School. Shout out to Curry. Um, but... He he has studied Vygotsky deeply and has gone into, you know, what Vygotsky actually wrote, gone to the source material. And he's seen, you know, that that the revolutionary character of Vygotsky has been ripped out of his work in the West. Um, and, and he told us about all the different revolutionary ideas that Vygotsky had, um, some which he got to implement in the USSR and some which he didn't. So very cool stuff. Um, let me copy and paste that bad boy. There you go. Check out Vygotsky. Capitalism didn't invent markets. They were in slavery and feudal periods. Very true. Um, even Rome. Rome was almost like a, a mini capitalism or a semi aristocracy set slash capitalism because uh, they had markets and a high level of trade and commerce um, alongside the slave system and the aristocracy, which ruled by blood lineage. Um, and yeah, American capital, I mean, American slavery was probably the closest thing we've seen to slavery existing directly alongside capitalism, because like I said, they basically had an unlimited cotton market. The European capitalists who were emerging and the Northern capitalists who were emerging basically needed unlimited cheap cotton. Um, so the plantation owners, uh, the more they produced, the more money they made. Um, 
And yeah, you see this brutal form of exploitation in, in Chattel slavery alongside capitalism, basically to feed capitalism. Slavery still going on. Yeah, good point. True. Uh, we published an article about that the other day. Um, yeah, so I shouldn't say the only example of slavery going on inside capitalism, especially because capitalism brings um, forms of slavery or increases different forms of slavery like the sex trade. Um, but I guess a, a slave society with a slave relation of production um, with legalized slavery, a state apparatus and a police force enforcing slavery. Um, I think the southern U.S. is the only time we've seen that aiding and working directly alongside capitalism. I might be wrong on that. This September 30th, Michael Parenti will be 89 years old. What a guy. He's done so much in those 89 years, huh? Love him. Rome also had very advanced productive forces compared to most their neighbors. Yes. Which, you know, once you have a dialectical materialist view of history, you see how important production is in warfare, um, how pro important production is to actually gaining political power and gaining wealth. It's not just armies going at each other. And, you know, this general came up with a better strategy than this general. And that's why this side won. You know, one of the main reasons the Soviets won World War II is because they were mass producing these efficient tanks, whereas the Germans were focusing on like luxury high end tanks and it was taking them way too long to make anything. Sadly, no one interviews Parenti. The only one is early 2000s. Yeah, he hasn't been. He's a little too old to be doing his thing. He has been for a while. And I don't know. There's there's also speculation that the State Department either threatened him or hurt him or I don't know. It makes me so mad to even think about. Um, We'll get them for you, Parenti. We will get the oligarchic capitalist class for you, I promise. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a video. I see someone some people talking about uh wokeness in the chat. Um, and I have this video called The Intellectual Roots of Wokeness. Um, and this guy basically argues that uh, wokeism stems from Marxism. So uh, I think that'll be interesting because we've been talking about wokeism lately and what that term means. Um, and actually, before I go on this rant, I'm going to go get some water because I want this rant to all be together in one part. Um so before and then, I start this, I just want to pull up the videos that I need. And then I'm going to go grab some water. And then I'll be back. And then we'll do... We'll talk about this video. And we'll talk about wokeness and Marxism. Wokeness versus Marxism. Um, what is wokeness? Is wokeness left wing? Is wokeness even a thing? Um, what will wokeness bring... <laughs> I'm just rambling now. Okay, um, I'm pulling up something for y'all to watch while I go get a uh, go get a drink. Um, I need to start getting drink be or water before I come out here. Yeah, you can watch me wrestle. Enjoy. I'll be back.
How am I doing? Am I winning? I'm pretty sure this match ends soon, so we can finish watching it. Oh, man. He just went over for me, didn't he? Boop. Hey, I did it. Okay. So, this is a video I recommend everyone check out um, called Wokeism. So, this is not some right wing Ben Shapiro, you know, feminist debunked compilation dumb crap from the Daily Wire. Okay, this is uh, Hans George Muller, who is a philosopher. Um, who right now is working in China. I think he's originally from Germany. I don't know if he calls himself a Marxist, but it's very clear that his work is inspired by Marx. Um, and he does a lot of analysis of pro-felicity, um, people's online profiles, how their online profiles in the modern era relate to their identities, um, how that affects behavior, how that affects psychology. Um, very, very interesting stuff that Carlos has taught at SIU for some of his classes. Uh, Carefree Wandering, someone asked. Yeah, that's the name of his uh, channel, is Carefree Wandering. Dr. Hans-George Muller is his, uh, his name, though. Um, so he did this analysis uh, and criticism of what he calls wokeism and basically gives a systematic explanation and definition of what he thinks wokeism is. Um, and, and then argues that it's not leftist, that it's not anti-capitalist um, for various reasons. Uh, so he talks about how wokeism has been co-opted by the CIA, you know, how the CIA is now advertising that they're diverse and that they're inclusive as they, you know, perpetrate coups and, and horrendous regime change efforts abroad, supporting uh, fascist governments um, in, in places like Bolivia recently with the 2019 coup um, or, or the U.S. State Department's propping up of right-wing extremist elements in Ukraine. Um, plenty of examples uh, as the CIA does these woke advertisements. Um, he criticizes that and then he criticizes basically the, the corporations in the U.S. co-opting um, the LGBTQ struggle to act like they're inclusive, to act like they're not oppressing people, to act like they're not exploiting people, to act like corporations and exploitation aren't causing um, all of our problems in society. Um, and, and they're actually moving us towards a more inclusive, progressive society, um, which, of course, isn't true. That doesn't you know get to the root of any of the problems. Uh, it doesn't do anything about the prison industrial complex, um, which exploits uh, exploits people massively in the prisons using uh, less than, you know, paying paying workers less than a dollar an hour in the prisons. Then you have this militarized police force, which uh, primarily or, or disproportionately targets uh, black and brown communities and, and impoverished communities. Um, so, you know, corporations putting a BLM sticker uh, or, or BLM flags everywhere does nothing to actually combat the militarized police force and the prison industrial complex, you know, but they're using it as, as sort of branding and marketing to act like they are moving us towards a, a better, more progressive society. Um, so in that way, Hans George Muller argues that wokeism um, is not just, you know, social progressivism or, or being left wing or progressive on social issues as well as economic issues. Um, but wokeism is actually pretending to be left wing or, or socially progressive in order to distract um, or tell people that we don't need to make any changes economically. Uh, we don't need to worry about exploitation. We don't need to worry about corporate in accumulation. We don't need to worry about imperialism. Don't you know the CIA is woke now? The CIA cares about LGBTQ people. Um, so therefore, it's OK if they overthrow foreign governments and put in power fascist dictatorships who hate LGBTQ people. Um, so so that's basically how Hans George Muller defines wokeism um, and says it's basically anti-Marxist or anti-socialist. Very interesting video. One of my favorite videos of all time. Now we have this video. Which is from. Ryan Chapman, who I don't know, he seems to have a handful of subscribers here. And he's going to argue the opposite. He's going to argue that Marxism 
is what created wokeism. So I don't know anything or that, that wokeism finds its intellectual roots in Marxism, basically the opposite of what our philosopher friend Carefree Wandering argued. I don't know anything about this uh, Ryan Chapman, um, but if if you know about him, post something in the chat. Oh, thank you for the sticker, Frick Frack. Let's go. Thank you so much for your support. Really appreciate that. Hey, what's up, everyone? Today, we're going to talk about some fairly uncontroversial stuff, like wokeness and Karl Marx. It's been fashionable for a while now to compare wokeness to a religion or to a cult, in that it has orthodoxy, heretics, original sin, and all that. But that's never struck me as a critique that hits the target dead on, in that it doesn't paint that clear of a picture of what makes wokeness distinct. And the critique that does do it for me, which you probably guessed, is the critique that wokeness fundamentally comes from the ideas of Karl Marx. I'm far from the first person to make that argument. And I think most people that talk about this stuff generally struggle to not sound like conspiracy theorists. And those are usually the grounds that are used to wave away this kind of criticism. But there's actually a lot of substance behind it. And if you follow the academic trail, all roads really do point to Karl Marx. So I'm going to go through it more slowly and thoroughly than I normally do, because I think this is all criminally misunderstood. So I haven't seen all of this, but I've seen this intro part. What I imagine he's going to try and do is trace the intellectual roots back to Karl Marx using the postmodernists, using Adorno, Horkheimer, um, and other French theorists, Frankfurt School theorists, who called themselves Marxists. Now, what we argued in our recent interview with Gabriel Rockhill and what Gabriel Rockhill has argued in his work was that basically all of those um, thinkers were pseudo-Marxists. They weren't actually Marxist at all because they all dismiss existing socialism. They dismiss the USSR and China as dictatorships and, you know, dismiss the Marxists of the Eastern world um, as, as just dictator supporters and tankies. Um, and, and meanwhile, working on this more intellectual uh, ideas based uh, Marxism in the West, in the Western Academy. Um, and, and, while some of these thinkers were directly supported by the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the CIA, um, others were indirectly supported by them. Um, so the CIA, uh, Rockefeller Foundation would fund the academies, um, fund the, the higher learning institutions, and basically create the conditions um, for uh, imperialist, pseudo-Marxist academics to rise to prominence. And, and you know, there was a time where you could become a superstar intellectual, largely with funding from the Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation, if you would say certain things, if you would dismiss the Soviet Union as a dictatorship and China as a dictatorship while calling yourself a socialist. Um, so even if the CIA wasn't directly influencing their opinions, they were creating the conditions for these, these sort of thinkers to exist. Um, and this is extremely, extremely useful uh, for the CIA. Controlled opposition has always been one of their, you know, one of the most um, successful tactics in thwarting left wing organization. When the ruling class, you know, funds or controls uh, people who are pretending to be in the opposition, pretending to be in the rebellion, pretending to be left wing anti-capitalist. Um and and Gabriel Rockhill argues that there's basically a global theory industry um, which produces these these kind of thinkers in the academy uh, very convincingly, I might add. So I imagine this guy over here is going to use he's going to say it started with Karl Marx. It went to Adorno and Horkheimer and the Frankfurt School in France, and then it turned into identity politics and wokeism when really. You know, you should say it started with Karl Marx. Um, China is still building Marxism, as are Cuba and many other countries, um, as was the Soviet Union back then. The U.S. created these imperialist pseudo-Marxists to try and trick people into thinking socialism has failed every time it's been tried. Um, and, and their theory sort of led to uh, anti-Marxist... Um, anti uh, wokeism or, or identity politics rather than actual anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist politics. And it needs to be understood if we're ever going to disentangle ourselves from this thing. So, yeah. So I'm going to start with going over Marxism. Not because I think you haven't heard explanations of Marxism before, but because I think explanations of it usually miss a crucial point. And that point's also crucial to understanding wokeness. 
And that crucial point is that Marxism is an ideology made fundamentally in opposition to liberalism. If that surprised you, then I'm glad you're watching this. Marxism at its core is a critique Correct. of liberalism and presents itself as the alternative to liberalism. And by liberalism, I don't... This guy already knows more about uh, Marx than Vouch. Vouch. Vouch said that Marxism's an extension of liberalism. So you got Vouch beat, uh, Ryan Chapman. Good job. I mean Democrats in America right now. I mean what we now think of as the founding principles of Western civilization. I'm sorry to say we're going to have to go over liberalism too because it's crucial to understanding everything else I'm going to say. So to give a quick refresher on that, Liberalism is the ideology that essentially champions the freedom of the individual, if at all humanly possible. So liberals want to maximize your personal rights while putting as few restrictions on it as possible. And the place where they mostly draw the line is if you put someone else in physical harm. So you don't have the right to punch someone in the face, and you don't have the right to shout fire in a crowded theater because people could panic and get hurt. But besides that, they want to maximize your individual freedoms. And that includes the freedom to think for yourself, um, speak for yourself, protest, um, have a fair trial, uh, own property, and a bunch of other stuff. So a quintessential liberal text is this one, the Bill of Rights. Liberalism was made as an attempt to form an ideology that represents the interests of everyone within a society. They thought that as long as everyone had a certain amount of rights that were protected and a freedom to voice their concerns, society would over time naturally become better and better. So I guess that's what liberalism is based on, or that's what liberalism says that it's based on. Um, and I'm sure he'll go into private property at some point here, but really what liberalism is, is the protection of private property and the seizure of political power by the bourgeois class. Um, so you had this, uh, this system of feudalism that was holding back progress, right? You had kings and queens and the church hoarding land and holding onto land as the peasants starved. Um, and, and you also had this emerging class of merchants, an emerging class of manufacturers, people who own manufacturing um, facilities. So capitalists, the emerging class of capitalists, and they wanted to take political power from the church and from the feudal class, um, at least at least talking uh, in Europe. Um, and yeah, the European Enlightenment was a little bit was different uh, philosophically than the American Revolution. But, you know, these ideals of liberalism kind of work across the board. Uh, but I'm mostly focusing on the French Revolution right now um, for this example. Um, but the the bourgeois class, the emerging bourgeois class took power while organizing the peasants, telling the peasants, hey, you hate the the landed aristocratic class too. help us overthrow them um, and the church. Um, and they did. And then they created their political system after that. So the political system was based on, you know, having a state that doesn't uh, infer on the rights of the individual. Um, in a state that keeps slavery illegal uh, or, or feudal relations of production illegal um, and, and allows for a contract between employer and employee, basically creates the basis for a system of wage slavery. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, it says we'll protect your political rights. You know, we'll give you absolute political freedoms. Um, but there's nothing about, you know, economic freedoms. Uh, the only economic freedom is the right to own private property. And there's nothing about, you know, what if the people who own private property accumulate and their wealth concentrates and they're massively exploiting everyone? Uh, liberalism has nothing to say about this. It's just like, ah, uh, we like freedom. Um, but really what I'm trying to say is it wasn't just a bunch of, of smart thinkers and wigs sitting in a room who are like, hmm, how do we come up with a system that gives people freedom? Right. It was a system that emerged materially. It was a system that emerged out of out of prior systems and and emerged when a new class of people took power. And that class of people put in a, a political system that would be beneficial to them and that would serve their own interests. That's what liberalism was, not just, you know, um, a bunch of really smart people thinking about how to maximize freedom. And they knew full well this would lead to all kinds of struggles and failures and dangers and all that. They said, overall, this is the best system. And over time, society will become more peaceful and more progressive. I think the main problem people have with liberalism is this idea that it's too passive of a take on progressiveness and that it doesn't actively try to encourage its citizens to improve the conditions of the least well off. And instead it instills this everyone for themselves kind of attitude. And within that, some people become wildly successful while others struggle and kind of fall through the cracks. So you could say that liberalism is great for laying down a base layer of human rights, but it also tends to create large power imbalances within society and doesn't actively encourage its citizens to do much about it, at least in any kind of expedient way. So because of that, there's room for other ideologies that address that. And that's where Marxism comes in. Marxist Marxism just extends 
I mean, this is a simplification too. I mean, it does look at the political rights of liberalism and say capitalism will make it so you can't live up to these. You won't have freedom of speech. The capitalists will control speech. You know, you won't have a democracy. The capitalists are going to control the elections. Um, so they, they say that liberalism can never live up to its own ideals. Um, but it's this is a very idealist explanation of the differences between liberalism and Marxism, right? Marxism says that liberalism kind of creates inequality in a sort of individualistic mindset. Like, no, you know, liberalism misses the fact that if you protect people's right to private property, if the state just works as a dictatorial force um, uh, protecting the right to private property, because of how capitalism works and how capital accumulates and concentrates, you know, you're going to have a massively unequal society, um, an imperialist society, a society with max exploitation, a society with constant economic crises, a society with homeless people, a society with a commodification of everything, including sex and drugs leading to sex and drug trades. Um, you know, these are the things that liberalism has nothing to say about, right? Because when it comes to economics, liberalism shrugs and says, well, we got to respect the contract between employer and employee, and we got to respect the, the right to private property. And, and there is, you know, where all the, the terrible things that we see resulting from capitalism in after years of development, that's what they result from um, a political system, which only cares about protecting private property. Um so, you know, it's not like Marxists are just like, oh, this kind of creates an individualist society. Why don't we have the government take everyone's private property away? It's no, you know, private property and, and the protection of private property and the employee-employee contract by the state is the basis of liberalism, which creates the basis of all the, the crappy things we see in class society today, um, as does the American Constitution, um, which is another liberal document. Um, thank you for the super chat for track. I got to go keep fighting the good fight. Everyone. I will absolutely watch this when it's up on the channel. Thank you so much. Um, appreciate you for the support. Um, 10 bucks. That's a big donation. So thank you very much. Um, again, can't believe y'all support us financially. Uh, I, I guess I can believe it cause I've seen it, um, so much. And I guess I know how much work actually goes into what we do. Um, but just really, really, really appreciate that. Um, yeah, yeah. That's all I got to say. Really appreciate it. It's basically say that liberalism is a protection mechanism for oppressive behavior. And the alternative that they put forward goes something like them saying, freedom ends where oppression begins. How do they know where oppression begins? Because they're pretty much obsessed with it. Marxists are basically bloodhounds for oppression. The freedom that Karl Marx was concerned with was the freedom to own private property. And the oppression that Karl Marx was concerned with was class oppression. So I should talk about oppression for a minute because the way that Marxists frame oppression is very distinct. We normally think of oppression as something that arises or doesn't. So I've said in the past that Marx doesn't talk that much about oppression. He talks more about exploitation, which I don't fully agree with that statement anymore because there are a lot of places where Lenin, Stalin, Marx, whoever else, Engels talk about oppression which stems from exploitation, right? The, the point is that I, I need to make is that exploitation is the core, right? Exploitation is the originator. It's the engine that leads to accumulation and imperialism and oppression and, and the oppression of minority groups, the, the oppression of um, the class of workers, um, the oppression of foreign nations. You know, all of these stem from accumulation, which is, you know, built into the capital, or uh, it, it, it all stems from exploitation, right? So you have uh, a worker works all day, uh, the capitalist takes what he creates and sells it in a market and then gives the worker a little piece um, of what he created uh, via the wage. And then the capitalist takes the surplus, takes the profit and uses it to expand his operations, continue with reproduction, and then takes them home as, as profit. That leads to accumulation, that leads to concentration, that leads to imperialism. So you, it's not oppression, you know, that leads to all of these, these negative things. It's exploitation, which is an economic category. It's, an, you know, it's something that we can analyze economically. We could put a mathematical number on, on exploitation, especially, you know, because of the way that Marx lays it out. Um, he, he does a very scientific and, and mathematical explanation of what exploitation actually is and how it leads to accumulation and these other things. You know, so, so Marxists aren't obsessed with oppression. We analyze oppression. We side with oppressed groups. 
Um, but we understand that the basis of oppression, you know, what's rotten at the core of the capitalist system um, is the the uh, employee employer relation and exploitation of the working masses, not just oppression. Circumstantially, and it's something that everyone should theoretically be capable of. So in one moment, you could hypothetically be an oppressor or not. And in another moment, I could be an oppressor or maybe even oppressed. And that should scale up too. like the Catholic Church. In one moment, you could say that they're an oppressor. And in another moment, you could say that they're not or maybe they're even oppressed. So we normally think of it as something that no one is inherently guilty of and also no one is inherently exempt from. And it's really dictated by a circumstance. Marxism, on the other hand, and this should already be sounding eerily familiar, has this particular way of dividing society up into two parts, the oppressed and the oppressors. And you're either in one group or the other. And what determines which group you fall into is based on your identity. No, Marxism doesn't do this because it gives, you know, analyses of different classes. It talks about the petty bourgeois class, the lumpen proletariat, the semi-proletariat, the peasantry. You know, it just says that the proletariat is the revolutionary class um, under in capitalist society, right? But it recognizes that there are other classes and that there are other classes even within capitalism. And the analysis of this is basically, you know, uh, like we can side or or ally with the petty bourgeoisie, lump and proletariat, peasant class, whatever else, to the extent that they're willing to be allied with us, right? If you have a small business owner who's willing to fund revolutionary struggle and, and do education and work alongside the masses, why would you not ally with that person? You know, you're not going to dismiss that person just because they're technically petty bourgeois, right? It, it all depends on where they fall in the struggle, you know, and post-revolution, obviously, we don't want them to keep like brutally exploiting people and trying to accumulate, you know, they got to be down for the the revolutionary struggle through and through. Um, but Mao, you know, talks about the the importance of allying with the petty bourgeoisie during the revolutionary period, um, because there are many sectors of the petty bourgeoisie who will will side with the socialists. And then there are many who will just kind of side with whoever it looks like is going to win. You know, uh, during revolutionary periods, the petty bourgeois oftentimes will be like, oh, you know, I'm with the capitalists. And then the capitalists will start to lose. And they're like, oh, OK, we're with you guys. Um, <laughs> they kind of switch it around. Um, but. So, you know, it's it's far from dividing class or society into oppressors and oppressed. Um, but, you know, on some level, there is a division, you know, of those who are down for the revolutionary struggle and those who are not um, based on, you know, where they side politically and, and um, ideologically. Um, however, you know, there's there, it's more complicated than that. Like Mao says, you know, we can ally with some groups on some things, but then not ally with them on other things where we disagree, you know? So again, it's not just as simple as dividing society into oppressors and oppressed and then saying, fight it out. And in Marx's case, it was based in class identity. And he thought that the dynamics of this oppression were baked into the nature of society itself. True. So the only way to overcome this oppression is to change society itself. In other words, have a revolution and make a new society free from oppression. So then you might ask, Pretty how much do you true. know what kind of fundamental change society needs in order to get rid of this oppression? And they would say, you need to figure out what was being allowed to occur in order for this oppression to take place. And in Marx's case, the freedom, again, that he was concerned with was the freedom to own private property. So the people who are exercising this freedom to own private property, and this includes the means of production, are necessarily the oppressors. And the people who are not exercising that freedom, so they don't own private property, are necessarily the oppressed. And as long as the freedom to own private property exists, oppression will inherently be baked into society. And he's saying exercising the freedom to own private property, you know, which is a liberal way to look at it. But it makes sense because he's, you know, talking about the difference between Marxism versus liberalism and liberalism claims to support freedom. You know, and Marx is saying you can't have a system that supports freedom so long as you protect private property because it's going to lead to accumulation, imperialism, blah, blah, blah. Marx thought that in order for this revolution to happen, people first need to awaken and see the nature of the oppression happening around them. And if they didn't, if they were blind to that oppression, in his terminology, they would then have false consciousness. If they awakened and they were able to see the true nature of this class oppression happening around them, in his terminology, they would gain class consciousness. Marx thought that a critical number of people needed to awaken to class consciousness. And if they did that, they would be naturally motivated to band together in a collective of like-minded class conscious people rise up and overthrow their oppressors and make a new utopian society. And by the way, the economic... Stop. 
Stop calling Marxism a utopia, please. Just stop. We need to construct a new society free of exploitation and class exploitation and imperialism. That doesn't mean a utopia. You can still stub your toe under communism and it'll still hurt. It's not going to be heaven. I'm sorry. Economic implementation of Marxism, where the freedom to own private property, especially if it relates to the means of production, is abolished, is communism. And the economic implementation of liberalism, where you have the right to own private property and you have the freedom to exchange goods and services with others, is capitalism. Well, that's not true. Because communism is supposed to be worker ownership of the means of production. Well, I guess private property specifically, you know, but it's not communism isn't abolishing the freedom to own private property and therefore the freedom to own the means of production. You know, communism is taking the means of production out of the hands of the few oligarchs who currently control it, you know, and using it to benefit the masses, giving it to the masses, allowing the masses to control and decide what's produced. Um, and distribute what's produced in a way that's rational, not just that's rational, but that allows society to develop, that allows people to develop intellectually, that allows people to be able to support themselves without having to work um, starvation wages or, you know, toil for hours and hours a day doing hard labor, um, which is, you know, why China is now surpassing the U.S. as the most powerful um, economy on the planet and why their retirement age has been sinking every year. It's now 55 for women, 60 for men. Um, why the U.N. has recognized China's poverty alleviation programs as the most incredible poverty alleviation programs in human history. Um, it is because of uh, uh, because not only uh, does socialism give workers more control in production and, you know, help the workers or, or design production and distribution in a way that that benefits the workers, but it increases the productive forces. Right. It's uh, socialism is all about construction, um, constructing a, a new society which supports the new ruling class, the working masses. Um, so it, it takes the means of production and advances them and, and you know, to their their utmost technological capabilities um, and and, you know, disperses the means of production so that it's owned by the mass of society. So, yeah, Marxism 101. Marxism is an inherently unstable ideology that tends to initially sound good, but then gets out of control. So if a Marxist says freedom ends where oppression begins. That sounds just like liberalism. <laughs> liberalism sounds really good. They say they're going to protect your freedom and then it gets out of control. And then we protect the freedom to own private property. And then the people who own private property accumulate billions and billions of dollars. And then 80% of the country lives paycheck to paycheck. And the military budget is $700 trillion because you're uh, killing people and bombing people all around the world uh, to protect and expand the wealth of those people who own private property. And it all starts, you know, from, oh, just let us own private property, man. It's going to be good. We're going to protect your freedom. Just trust us, man. Um, yeah. You might say, hey, I mean, that doesn't sound bad. We don't want to be born into a world where people oppress us for things we can't control. But then you say, wait, where is this oppression? And they say, everywhere. And then you say, well, who gets to say what is and isn't oppression? And they say, we do. And you say, can we talk about it? And they say, no. If you disagree with them, Marxist organizations tend to categorize you as part of the problem. So this is why the exploitation versus oppression distinction is important. As this person says here, we can infer ethical conclusions, but Marx was not a moralist, right? A, a Marxist analysis is not about the oppression Olympics. So it's not what Ryan Chapman just said it is, right? It's not, you know, these groups are the oppressed and these groups are the oppressors. And, and we decide who's oppressed and who are the oppressors based on whatever is convenient. Right. The goal of Marxism is, is getting rid of exploitation and alienation and, you know, the wage labor or wage slavery relation while also increasing the productive forces. But um, exploitation, as we were saying, is something that can be measured. It's something that can be measured mathematically. Right. There's a certain amount of surplus value that a capitalist takes versus a certain amount that's given to the worker and wages and a certain amount that's produced, a certain amount that's sold on the market um, and transformed into money. Um and, you know, these things lead to accumulation and oppression, like we said. Um, but the goal is abolishing exploitation, this this very this measurable material thing at the core of society. You're exploited every day when you go to work. 
um, you get a certain amount of money in wages and your your boss gets a, a large percent of that money um, in, in his surplus value. Um, so, you know, the the class struggle then is determined by exploitation, right? The class struggle is determined by who is the toiling class and who is the exploiting class, you know? And, and as we were saying before, uh, if people in, in other classes choose to side with the toiling class, that's great. You know, then they can fight on the side of the toiling class in the class struggle. But the, the lines are drawn in the class struggle based on who's exploiting and who's not. You know, it's not based on my arbitrary uh, idealist conception of who are the oppressors and who's not the oppressors, right? You can't measure oppression mathematically. You can't measure who the oppressed class is. You can look at, you know, um, how minority groups are, are preyed upon by the police or, or exploited um, extra uh, and, and stuff like that and talk about these issues of oppression. Um, but ultimately, the class struggle stems from exploitation. There would still be a class struggle, even if those um, other forms of like racist oppression or whatever else didn't exist. You know, there would still be exploitation and, and the need for class struggle. Um, and, and, you know, this is like if you look at feudalism, the exploited class were the peasants. The exploiting class were the, the monarchs and, and the feudal lords and the church. Um, so that's what drew the lines in that class struggle. You had the emerging emerging capitalist class who didn't like the feudal uh, the feudal system or the feudal ruling class. And then you had the peasants who also didn't like the feudal ruling class. Um, so these lines were drawn uh, uh, based on class struggle based on or these these lines of class struggle. This battle between classes is drawn ba or the lines are drawn based on exploitation. So I'm tripping over my words. I'm probably going rambling too long. Um, here, I'll try and keep it short and sweet next time I come back. And when Marxist organizations come into power, they tend to shortly after declare speech and action against the movement as oppression, and they abolish political opposition, and things tend to quickly go further downhill from there. As you probably know, every attempt to implement Marxism so far upon a whole country has been a disaster for human rights, bringing tyranny, death, censorship, and shortages, and never bringing the free utopian society that was promised and we think was responsible for the deaths of something like 100 million people in the 20th century. And the people who suffer the worst are always working class people. The people. Come on, Ryan, you were doing well. Ish. But th then he cited the Black Book of Communism. The 100 million statistic, the people who came up with that statistic themselves said it's not true. So maybe do a Google search on that next time. People who Marxism was promising to represent. But that being said, Karl Marx was a pretty smart guy, and a lot of the critiques he made of liberalism and capitalism were pretty sharp. And if you read some of them today, you might even agree with them, even if he's obviously not capturing the full picture. I think because of that, there have, since Marx's death, always been people who were inspired by him and didn't think that the disasters of trying to implement Marxism were enough of a deterrent and decided to try to adapt Marx to their own political environment. So the practice of doing that, of taking Marx and adapting him, not taking him literally word for word, is called neo-Marxism. No, no. Taking Marxism and adapting it to your own conditions is called Marxism. That's what Marxism is. Marxism isn't based off a person. It isn't based off the doctrine of Karl Marx like he was some religious figure who wrote the Ten Commandments. Marxism is a science. Marxism is a lens of analysis. Marxism is a living, breathing, intellectual tradition of people who have attempted to apply to apply Marxist analysis to their own countries and organize class struggle in their own countries to construct and bring about a better society, not a utopia, but a better society that uh, maximizes human flourishing. Um, it, it is not, or, I mean, that is Marxism. Marx was very clear that he was analyzing Europe. You know, and towards the end of his life, as he got to look elsewhere, you know, he said my analysis or the the analysis that I did for Europe, you know, I, I kind of showed how to do it. I gave an example, but that needs to be applied everywhere. Right. We need to to look at class struggle and, you know, look at every single unique country through a historical materialist lens. And Lenin was very clear about this. Lenin was extremely clear, so clear, in fact, that he said, you know, Marx was looking at Europe during the Industrial Revolution. So he said that the, the revolution would be led by the proletariat, you know, the, the class of wage laborers. 
because that's what the class was in Germany because they had more developed capitalism. But in Russia, we have a giant class of peasants. You know, Russia is a semi-feudal country. We don't have fully developed capitalism. So the proletariat, who Marx identified as the revolutionary class, in Russia should ally with the peasants because the peasants are also the explo- or also an exploited and therefore potentially revolutionary class. So you want to talk about applying Marxism, you know, to, to their own conditions. Um, that is Marxism Leninism, not neo Marxism, not Adorno and Horkheimer and the Frankfurt School and all these CIA backed French academics talking about how the Soviet Union and China are evil, big, bad dictatorships. Marxism Leninism is taking Marxism and adapting it to every country's conditions and tweaking it to meet countries' conditions. But neo Marxists don't call themselves neo Marxists. They tend to just call themselves plain Marxists. So I'm going to use that word too because it's shorter and there's about zero people trying to adapt Marx literally in the 21st century. And I don't know how to talk about neo Marxists without feeling like I'm doing this. So I think wokeness is the result of a series of adaptations of Marx. And I think that there's a clear intellectual path we can follow to get us there. And I'm actually not aware of any alternatives. So if you have one, let me know because I'm genuinely curious. But in the meantime, I'm going to lay out the path of adaptations as I understand it. It's just the U.S. State Department co-opting anti-racist struggle and LGBTQ struggle. You know, racism and sexism and bigotry uh, have been built into this country in the past. You know, the U.S. used... Uh, the U.S. State Department and the ruling class used racism to justify their exploitation. You know, of course, you had slavery based on skin color in this country. And then after that, you know, you have the prison industrial complex, the, the racist war on drugs. Racism has been used to exploit. But now that the ruling class, you know, sees that people don't like racism and people are mad about racism and people are mad about, you know, discrimination against LGBTQ people. They just, you know, slap a bunch of BLM flags on their stuff and wave a bunch of pride flags and try and pretend like they haven't been exploiting or or oppressing minority groups for years. That's all it is, is, you know, because of mass struggle, you know, thankfully, uh, or I mean, thankfully, there's been massive struggle against racism and sexism. And now corporations are trying to co-opt that. So we won't realize that they are the ones who are actually perpetrating um, racism and sexism and bigotry, uh, as well as the system of exploitation and the wage, uh, wage slavery relation at the core of capitalist society. I'm going to break it down into three major steps. The first was to expand Marx's ideas, which were at the time almost entirely about class, into the realm of culture. The first major influence for this came from this Italian man in the early 1900s who argued that elites control culture and that control they have over culture gives them a kind of dominating influence over the public and makes the public kind of complacent with whatever the agenda elites have for them. So in liberal capitalist society, elites within that society can use culture to essentially brainwash the public into not questioning that society. And that's why these revolutions that Marx predicted haven't been happening. So to fix that, Marxists need to get influence in culture And once they they gain that cultural influence, they can use it to educate the public. And once that happens, then the public will rise up and revolution will happen. I hate kind of how they always attach Gromsky to the Frankfurt School, assuming that's where he's moving. I'm sure that's where he's going now that he said neo-Marxists are the root of Idpol. I'm sure he's going to the French and Frankfurt School um, thinkers. And, you know, Gromsky was basically said, you know, the capitalists, once they accumulate and control more and more, they're just they're also going to control the media apparatuses um, and they're going to control the education systems and they're going to use it, you know, to to perpetrate capitalist education, capitalist propaganda, capitalist brainwashing, which, of course, he was right about. And that's just an extension of Marx's analysis. Um, And then a lot of the Frankfurt School thinkers would draw on Gromsky. But Gromsky, I wish he wasn't associated with like these postmodernists or the so-called neo-Marxists, because I think Gromsky's analysis is awesome um, versus a lot of the neo-Marxists were CIA um, or or CIA adjacent. Um, And Gromsky wrote his stuff from prison, not from the wealthy academies. So the incorporation of Gromsky, sorry, thank you for the pronunciation help of Marxism into culture is called cultural Marxism. And no, that's not a right-wing anti-Semitic buzzword. That's an actual academic word that people have been using for a long time. And if you don't believe me, go into Google Scholar and type in cultural Marxism. Cultural Marxism was then expanded upon starting in the 20s and 30s by the work of a think tank called the Frankfurt School, which was a bunch of guys that basically set out to criticize and readapt Marx after they saw that Marxism had failed to overtake capitalism in Western civilization. 
and they expanded upon these ideas of no after socialism had risen in the east and taken over the capitalist or feudal or oppressive imperialist systems in the east and threatened the capitalist systems in the west the cia started supporting pseudo marxist academics academics who called themselves marxists while saying the soviet union that's ridiculous they don't understand marxism china they don't understand marxism i don't care what they're doing only i understand marxism here in this french uh college um heavily funded by the rockefeller foundation and the cia only i understand marxism um and this is real true marxism and real true Marxism doesn't care about revolution. You know, it's all about sitting in the academy and, you know, taking LSD and, um, yeah. <laughs> Cultural Marxism, saying that the elites who control culture in all these different ways are the oppressors and regular people who are subject to the impositions of this culture are the oppressed. And the culture they're critiquing is the liberal culture. So they're saying that liberal culture is basically forcing people into these boxes of how it wants them to behave and how to think. So it's controlling their thoughts, it's controlling their behavior. And they say this all has a dehumanizing effect that makes them not be able to think outside the system and to be less alive. And if you shift people's focus entirely towards culture, um, like people are saying cultural Marxism is a right-wing dog whistle. Um, it probably is, but I mean, his, I'm sure it is at this point, but his explanation of what the Frankfurt School thinkers said isn't that wrong, right? Like this idea that they wanted to focus, you know, more on ideas, you know, more on cultural struggle. Because if you get people to focus on cultural struggle rather than class struggle, you take all their real power away. You take their material struggle away. Um, so they only struggle in the realm of ideas, which, of course, isn't isn't real struggle at all. Well, it can be right. We're struggling in the realm of ideas right now by spreading socialist education. Um, but that only matters if y'all go organize. Right. If y'all actually do something materially to engage in material class struggle. So these pseudo Marxist, you know, pro CIA thinkers. Um, we're getting everybody to stop thinking about class struggle and, and start thinking about um, ideological struggle only, cultural struggles, um, various sort of uh, identity struggles. Uh, so, you know, kind of what I'm sure he's going to describe here is wokeness, you know, wokeness as opposed to uh, actual material class struggle. Um, yeah, and I, I don't think that's entirely wrong. Uh, uh, Gabriel Rockhill points out that um, pretty much all of the the neo-Marxist or Frankfurt School academics in France, whenever there was a real uprising, whenever there was a workers uprising, um, when the workers did something materially in terms of struggling against their exploiters, uh, the Frankfurt School dismissed it. Right. They dismissed it as as uh, violent and bad. And, you know, we just need to sit in the academy and write more books, you know, stop engaging in all that darn class struggle. And of course, you know, two of the famous ones, Adorno and Horkheimer, supported the freaking Vietnam War. They supported the U.S. in the Vietnam War because Ho Chi Minh and the Vietnamese and the Viet Minh were violent. And apparently, it's not violent to drop Agent Orange and napalm on, on civilians and peasant farmers. But I think the main contribution of the Frankfurt School was to take these types of critiques and place them in a modern, um, updated American framework. Because they're mostly working out of New York at the time and mostly critiquing American culture. So that gave people on the left in America access to these kinds of critiques. And on top of that, they wove in these radicalizing arguments for the left, like this book, which tried to redefine authoritarianism as something that not anyone can be capable of, but something that only the... How can you argue that this is a Marxist book? I mean, I understand Ryan Chapman, right? He doesn't really understand what Marxism is. But how do Marxists today argue that the authoritarian personality is a Marxist book? This is one like both side ism, which is the number one thing propagated by the CIA and the U.S. State Department and the in bourgeois propaganda since World War II. You know, this idea that Hitler and Stalin were the same um, because they both had the authoritarian personality. They were both totalitarian. Um, forget the fact that their governments and their economies were totally different and came about in a totally different way and that the communists uh, fought the fascists and the Soviets inflicted 80% of German casualties. Forget that. Hitler and Stalin were the same. Both had the authoritarian personality. And this is so individualistic. This is so individualistic. Some people have the authoritarian personality and some people have the submissive personality. No, this is not Marxism. Marxism is class analysis. You know, the only time Marxism goes into the individuals when he, he's talking about the individual workers, individual relation with the capitalist. So then he can expand it to a class analysis and say it's in the interests of everyone in this class to overthrow the ruling class. 
what the heck are you talking about with this, you know, analyzing everybody's individual personality and, you know, we can't, uh, some people are just, you know, more lenient towards authoritarianism naturally. They're just born with it. What are you talking about? That's not materialist. You know, that's not the idea that our environment and, you know, the, the structure of society is what shapes our psychology and our interests. This is totally anti-Marxist, even though the idea of this, the very idea of this book, which this is one of the most famous books that the CIA just freaking loved uh, that came out of the Frankfurt School. Right is capable of. This was another hugely influential piece, which argued that tolerance in the traditional sense of being tolerant of people you disagree with actually serves to protect oppression happening in society. And as an alternative, he proposes liberating tolerance. And what is that? It's to be intolerant of people on the right and extra tolerant of people on the left. So he's advocating against free speech for people on the right. And he's saying to enforce this, people can go outside the law if they need to, and even use violence if they need to, since he questions the effectiveness of nonviolence. The people who read this and believe that this is Marxism have never read Marx or any of the serious Marxist revolutionaries who actually brought Marxism into practice. Mao was huge, huge on reaching everybody. You know, he said that when we capture prisoners of war, even when they were fighting a civil war against the right wing imperialist backed nationalists, they would let the prisoners of war go instead of torturing them. They would treat them with respect. And Mao said over and over again, you know, even the most reactionary members of the masses, uh, you shouldn't shame them and throw crap at them or mock them for their ignorance. That'll just push them, you know, more into reaction. You need to encourage them to go forward, encourage them to progress in their politics, you know, to, to educate themselves and become a socialist or communist, engage in the struggle. And then you have Adorno who's like, nope, you know, if you think somebody's right wing, if they have conservative social values, you need to fight them. You need to physically fight them, just like grab a trash can and smash them over the head with it. Go totally WWE on the ass. Um, and then eventually that's how we'll bring about socialism and fight racism. Like this is just taking Marxism and taking the idea of class struggle and making it individualistic and idealistic rather than collective and materialistic. Speculating that Gandhi's success with it may have been a fluke. So this was basically the early intellectual version of the Antifa handbook, and also just a broad intellectual justification for the censorship of the right by people on the left while labeling it progressive. I know it's hard to imagine that these types of academic works can really have that much of an influence on reality, but you have to realize this guy was very popular at the time, especially on college campuses. He had a kind of superstar intellectual kind of status. Similar and that is largely what the CIA and the U.S. State Department facilitated, creating these superstar academics. So even if the academics weren't directly taking orders from the CIA, they knew, you know, if they wanted to keep this superstar status, if they wanted to keep making a bunch of money as an intellectual doing speaking engagements on college campuses, facilitated by the State Department and the Rockefeller Foundation and the Ford Foundation and the CIA, they had to keep, you know, talking about how evil China and the Soviet Union are and talking about how Marxism um, has always failed, even though I'm totally a Marxist, bro. More to how we think of like Zizek or Peterson or maybe Bell Hooks today. So this wasn't like some kind of obscure work that nobody read. But anyway, I'm just gonna do one more because I'm trying not to make the section boring and I'm not totally confident that I'm succeeding at it. This paper brought together the ideas of the Frankfurt School under the name critical theory. Critical theory compares itself to traditional theory, which is when people try to be objective in their examination of and interpretation of the world. Critical theorists, on the other hand, have their political goals in mind as they work through academia. So they don't say what they think is objectively true. They say, if they're a critical theorist, what they need to say in order to reach their political goals. So this is planting the seeds for the death of objectivity in leftist academia and giving intellectual justification for people to work in academia as political agents. So what are the goals they said academics should be aiming for? To adapt Marx and transform us into the right kind of society. What kind of society is that? A society where there is no exploitation or oppression. A society where injustice is abolished. The second major stage started in the 60s when this cultural Marxist framework was adapted by identity politics movements. At the time, there was a huge resurgence of interest in Marx, especially among young people. And the activism that came out of that is broadly referred to as the New Left. And the leader of the New Left is mostly thought to be Marcuse, who wrote Repressive Tolerance, who I was just talking about. So he was working at the same time that this stage was starting. So the timelines are a little bit blurred. And Marcuse has written a book like that uh, Carlos has uh, criticized and talked about how there are good things in it, but mostly ripped it apart called One Dimensional Man. 
basically arguing that there's no class division anymore, that the classes are culturally the same and, you know, that therefore there's no class struggle. The classes have merged. Notice how everything that came out of the Frankfurt School and the new left and um, what this guy's saying eventually led to wokeism, all of that, um, it distracts from class struggle. You know, it's we need to focus on critical theory and we need to struggle, you know, in, in the intellectual field by by applying uh, or by, yeah, by uh, attacking things that are right wing and being left wing um, when it comes to academia. Um, and then uh, Marcuse, oh, there's only there's only, you know, one it's one dimensional man. There's no class struggle between two divided classes, you know, which is a struggle created by exploitation. Uh, the working masses invest into the stock market now. You know, they have tiny 401k plans. So they're basically capitalists. Forget about class struggle. Um, it's it's anything to distract people from actually organizing their workplace and fighting for better conditions. Together. Anyway, this is the time period where critical race theory was developed, which took critical theory and integrated it into a racial framework. Critical race theory presumes that unfavorable differences in group outcomes come from racial oppression. And as a solution wants to end racial oppression, among a broader goal of wanting to end all forms of oppression, which also puts us in a world where the First Amendment is attacked on the grounds of being a protection mechanism for racial oppression. Around the same time, second wave feminism showed up as an alternative to the more liberal first wave that came before it. And the basic Marxist contribution to that was to take Marx's idea of the proletariat breaking free of their chains and seizing the means of production from the bourgeoisie, taking that and replacing it with women breaking free of the shackles that men had put on them and empowering each other to rise up and smash the patriarchy. That's a not a Marxist contribution. You know, that's liberal feminism co-opting Marxism and you know, taking Marxism and saying, you know, forget about that class struggle. It's all about a struggle between genders. But Marx and Engels were like the OG feminists, especially for their time um, when it comes to old white men in Europe, I guess. Um, Engels said that, you know, you can judge the advancement of any society based on the role of women in that society, the place of women in that society, um, because capitalism degrades women and it forces them into um, sex work to survive um, and, and exploits them and, and is dependent on their domestic labor and, and ties them to the home and monogamous relationships, which oftentimes um, can become abusive. And then women have trouble leaving those relationships if they're financially tied to the men. Uh, capitalism is extremely exploitative to women. So therefore, you know, real women's liberation, real women's emancipation uh, comes from class struggle, from the struggle of working class men and working class women against the capitalist class. So we can construct a society that that does give women, you know, um, their proper place and, and does allow women to develop themselves and does give women all the, the political um, rights and economic opportunities that men have. Um, but you're not going to have that unless you have class struggle, right? You can't have that just between struggle between genders. That is liberalism. Um, and, you know, that's much of what the Western Academy did at this time was, uh, um, you know, argue against Marxist feminism and in favor of liberal feminism. We just need gender struggle against the patriarchy, not a class struggle against the ruling class and the patriarchy because the ruling class are the ones who uphold and, and create the patriarchy. The Gay Liberation Front happened around the same time. And I think for a lot of people, it was just an opportunity to get respect and visibility for people who weren't straight. But if you look at the literature, like the manifestos that came out of it, it did have an explicitly Marxist society. Necessarily means white people are the oppressors and non-white people are the oppressed. In feminism, it became the power dynamics in patriarchal society necessarily means men are the oppressors and women are the oppressed. Replacing class with gender and race and sexuality. And in queer theory, it became the power dynamics in heteronormative society necessarily. So I, I honestly think we get the, the gist of it now. It's pretty much what I thought it was. Um, but yeah, he, he tr it's interesting because he's not a Marxist. So he tries to trace the intellectual roots of Marxism to wokeism or to, you know, replacing the idea of class struggle with exclusively gender struggle or exclusively racial struggle, you know, taking class struggle out of it. And he says, because the neo-Marxists in France in the Frankfurt School propped up these ideas and created these ideas, therefore, you know, they, they can be traced directly back to Karl Marx. Missing the fact that, you know, Marxism is alive and well in China and the East and uh, the global South, 
Um, but those Marxists don't dismiss existing socialism, right? They learn from China and Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union, and they consider these to be socialist countries, uh, but we need to learn from their failures and, you know, adapt Marxism to our current conditions um, over 200 years after Marx died because um, conditions have changed. Uh, but in the U.S., you know, we have this sort of ridiculous uh, pseudo idea of Marxism that's been propped up in the academy by the U.S. State Department, by the ruling capitalist class, um, by the U.S. intelligence agencies like the CIA. Um, and it masquerades as being Marxism, right? It pretends to be Marxism when in reality it's just liberalism. It says we care about gender struggle and racial struggle and class struggle. But in reality, Marxism has always cared about struggle or the struggles of oppressed groups, the uh, racial and gender struggles. It just recognizes that class struggle is necessary to actually bring about change, you know, and actually bring about um, successful struggle when it comes to to other forms, to uh, gender struggle and, and uh, anti-racist struggle. And what the the pseudo Marxist Frankfurt School thinkers do is conceal that, you know, they say, nope. It's it's just you just got to focus on racial and gender struggle. Otherwise, you'll end up like the evil Soviet Union and evil China. Forget the fact that the Soviet Union and China massively increased life expectancy for the working masses, taught their entire populations to read, expanded health care to millions who didn't have it, ended famines. You know, forget that Marxism's always failed. Just focus on this cultural stuff. You know, just be woke. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting that Ryan Chapman looked at that and thought it could be directly traced to Marx. Um, and it shows how how it shows the purpose of what Gabriel Rockhill calls the global theory industry um, in producing this kind of pseudo Marxist theory. Um, and it shows how how good of a job they've done to where someone who's not a Marxist like Ryan Chapman can take a look at this um, and think that wokeism stems from Marxism. And, and I think it's a similar phenomenon with Jordan Peterson. Right. I think Jordan Peterson looked at the pseudo Marxist Frankfurt School thinkers and then he was like, oh, this is what Marxism is. It's just liberalism now or, or extreme liberalism, wokeism or whatever. So um, if if people someone posted a book recommendation in the chat, it looked like a good one. Um, but I would really recommend people check out the work of Gabriel Rockhill. Um, Gabriel Rockhill studied with the Frankfurt School. He studied with them in France. He went there to. Um, to learn from them, you know, kind of following just, you know, on a normal intellectual path, like seeking the truth, you know, as a Marxist, he went to France to try and learn more about Marxism. But the more he learned from these people and the more he studied their work, um, he realized that it was anti-Marxist. It was anti-class struggle. It was pointing people towards only, um, you know, cultural struggles rather than or fighting what we now call the culture war. Uh, rather than engaging in class struggle and material struggle. Um, that's what, what all their work was based on. And, and then he spent so much time tracing their connections to the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the CIA, um, finding all the different ways in which the State Department controls academia um, in which they, and all the different ways that they've influenced and propped up these pseudo-Marxist uh, controlled opposition sort of thinkers. Um, so we did a two hour podcast with him. Uh, I wasn't there. Sadly, I was at a wedding when we filmed this, which broke my heart because Gabriel Rockhill is freaking amazing. I, I shed a few tears when I, I couldn't hang out with him and, and talk to him. Um, but I'm so proud of this interview, the fact that we have it. Um, shout out to Gabriel Rockhill. He's taught me so freaking much. Yeah. And yeah. All right. I'm glad we finally finally got that video off the list. I've been planning on responding to that video forever. I just knew it would take a lot of energy. You know, you feel me? Some videos take more energy to debunk than others. I got to focus. That one was talking about academia a lot. I only spaced out like three times. So that's good. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows it. Hi, I'm John Green. Hi, I'm John Green. I'm going to be a Marxist soon, hopefully. If I get a chance to sit with John Green. Hi, I'm Green, John Green, and this is... I'll turn him into a Marxist, guaranteed. Guaranteed, y'all. Who 
Oops, where'd my comments go? I accidentally closed them. My favorite Michael Parenti lecture originally appeared on C-SPAN in 1991. Um, it is on YouTube and it is called A Critical Assessment of the New World Order. Interesting. I'll check that out. They still have something to say. Of course they have something to say. The Frankfurt School writers had like 20... I mean, there's a whole bunch of academics doing nothing but writing theory. Of course, they, you know, came up with something that was correct at some point. But uh, I don't think towing the Stalinist line here is a good response to critical theory. I don't think character assassination and comparing people to, to Stalin is a good defense of critical theory. Because that's what all of critical theory is based on, this boogeyman of Stalin. This idea that Marxism in the East is just uh, too primitive and they didn't really understand Marxism and only us white folks and you know, in the Anglo countries can really understand Marxism and really apply Marxism. And it's actually critical theory. And Stalin was just a big bag boogeyman who ate all of the grain in Ukraine because he wanted to starve people for fun. Um, when in reality, you know, Stalin was the leader of the first socialist experiment. And if you read uh, China, uh, or if you read the debate going on in China after the revolution, they're learning from what Stalin did. You know, they're deeply analyzing every single policy that the Soviet Union enacted in terms of agriculture, industry, whatever else, and then analyzing the results of that policy. And they come to, you know, sort of a generalization. They say Stalin was 70 percent correct, 30 percent wrong. So that's the living, breathing history of Marxism. That is the living, breathing history of socialism. Um, which has been drawn from Karl Marx, the works of Karl Marx, expanded on by Lenin, Stalin, added to by, or then added to by Stalin, Ho Chi Minh, Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping, um, all of these people who have actually engaged in the process of constructing Marxism. Um, that is where Marxism, you know, the tradition of, that's what the tradition of Marxism has led to, and that's who inherits the tradition of Marxism today. Um, these Frankfurt School thinkers, um, are not, you know, they, they dismiss all of that as just wrong and bad, um, and then try and do their own thing. Um, so, I mean, you're going to have to go a little bit more in depth, uh, to, to debunk those Gabriel Rockhill's arguments, um, against the Frankfurt school and, and how the Frankfurt school gets their funding rather than, you know, you're a Stalinist. Uh, you're, it, I mean, <laughs> that, that argument's kind of played out also, don't you think? And it was handed to you by the CIA themselves. Thank you so much, TM. $20. Wow. Thank you so much. Y'all are too kind supporting us. I promise, promise every dollar you give us will, will be invested in um, education, uh, reaching people, organizing, and making sure Carlos and I don't starve or live on the streets. So thank you so much. Incredible that this poop capitalist system has us on the verge of nuclear annihilation and some fuckers will still come out of the woodwork attacking Stalin, who has been completely vindicated by history. I like you, Sean Moon. Stalin wrote 30 books. No one was more devoted to Leninism than Stalin. Nobody ever reads Stalin's books, though. You know, you'll never see... Sometimes the Frankfurt School people will, like, cite dialectical and historical materialism. Stalin's pamphlet, like, summarizing, um, you know, giving a broad summary of Diamat, um, which can be a little bit simplistic at times, but that was the point of the book. Um, so they'll cite that and say, you know, Soviet, uh, Soviet Marxism was mechanistic. You know, or Soviet Marxism was way too simplistic and, and not dialectical enough. Um, but then they'll never cite, you know, like the 30 books that Stalin read. And what they'll really never do is cite the Soviet academics, the Soviet Marxists at the time, the, the most advanced Soviet theorists within the party or, or the, the most advanced debates within the Soviet Union at the time. Because if you actually saw those, if you actually read those, if you would, you can now go into the Soviet archives, at least if you speak Russian. Um, then you would know that the Soviet Union, uh, their idea of Marxism was not super simple, right? It was not super robotic and mechanical. You know, they were working on the most advanced problems in Marxism and uh, the most advanced questions facing Marxists at the time, which some are, you know, still around today. Um, 
And they had an entire country of people, you know, very intelligent people working to understand Marxism and adapt Marxism and construct socialism. And the idea that, you know, the whole country of people was just unsophisticated and mechanistic. Those those Easterners um, were just mechanistic in their understanding of Marxism. But we, you know, the white folks in the French Academy, you know, the 10 of us in the Frankfurt School or whatever, we can actually understand Marxism. Um, it's super arrogant and chauvinistic um, and silly. Uh, okay. I've had enough of this. I'm sorry, comrade. <laughs> you're going on a timeout. Well, not comrade. You're, you're saying you're getting way too reactionary for me to want to let you uh, flood the chat with these comments. <laughs> oh, did someone, did someone mute them already? Why can't I see this on Twitch? Oh, it's on YouTube. I'm dumb. Why can't I see this on Twitch? Oh, it's on YouTube. I'm coming for you. Can I mute? Put user in a timeout. There you go. Learn to support Stalin, then you can come out of your timeout. Oh, uh, the plans of forced industrialization. The first two five-year plans are very brutal. They were brutal just because the Soviet economy was such garbage then. You know, they were brutal because what they were trying to construct socialism out of, what they were trying to industrialize out of, was a peasant economy run by the czarist monarchy, who were constantly sending the peasants and the people to go fight and die, fight and die in uh, useless wars for expansion, um, for accumulation and the expansion that only benefited the czars and the, the ruling class in Russia. Um, so that's the reason that like industrialization and collectivization was difficult in Russia. Same with China, right? And China acknowledges this and they acknowledge that people died during that time, but people were dying of starvation and famines uh, very consistently for years prior. I mean, one thing that's fun to do, not fun, I mean, but one thing that's interesting to do is, is go and look at the list of famines in Russia, you know, and even if you look at um, like capitalist propaganda that's going to try and make the Soviet Union look bad. You know, there's like famines year after year after year after year. And after the industrialization and collectivization of the Soviet Union, you know, they had a developed economy that didn't experience these constant famines anymore. It's like, yeah, that process of industrialization and collectivization was, as you said, brutal or it was hard. It was very hard work. Um, but that's what allowed them to abolish illiteracy. That's what allowed them to get rid of malnutrition. That's what allowed them to house and educate their entire population. You know, that's what allowed all these incredible gains of socialism. And that's why these things are so incredible, because they came out of a country that was formerly semi-feudal and extremely poor and a monarchy. Communism ends the famines. You're darn right it does. You're darn right. Um, yeah, so the Wikipedia page here, just showing y'all what I mean. Oh, no, that's not what I wanted. There we go. Um, after 1947, there were no known, fa known famines. So after the first years of industrialization, even though, of course, the, you know, Wikipedia and the bourgeois academics are going to try and make um, the USSR look as bad as possible. And the Soviet famine, this uh, that happened in Ukraine, was a real famine. It wasn't an intentional genocide, as the right-wing Ukrainian nationalists and Yahtzees and Yahtzee sympathizers claim. Um, but there was a real famine where people died due to crop diseases like smut and rust, as well as uh, mice and um, insect infestations and uh, droughts and uh, flooding at, at separate times. Um, so there was a real famine, but... Um, in the 17th century, there were millions of people dying of famine all the time and the 18th century and the 19th century, right? And then after the industrialization, collectivization of the Soviet Union, there wasn't another famine after 1947. I highly doubt that would have been the case had they just stuck with czarist um, monarchy um, and semi-feudal capitalism or even just allow themselves to develop into a fully capitalist society. 
they would still have the famines. Also, the Holodomor was caused by U.S.-U.K. sanctions. Stalin saved countless lives. True. And that's what's so interesting when you, like, go actually go into the Soviet archives and actually read what Stalin was saying, like I was saying before. Because he was like, everything the Soviets were doing and everything the party was doing was trying to feed people. You know, they were, Stalin was so worried and, and spent so much time thinking about and writing about, you know, how are we going to feed people? How are we going to craft our economic policy in a way that allows us to collectivize and industrialize without causing a bunch of people to starve? Um, and then the U.S. portrays it as, you know, Stalin just purposefully starved these people because he was mad at Ukraine one day. Um, and then you go look at the archives, like it's the opposite. The capitalists are always just lying. They just invert reality pieces of poop and big old jerks yeah dude stalin was so awesome and like i could make all these arguments about stalin right i've been talking about stalin off and on for like two hours and 20 minutes now and americans will just say stuff like that you know yeah dude stalin was awesome don't you know stalin bad haven't you heard stalin ate all the grain in Ukraine with a giant spoon and forced people to starve. Like Stalin's name is such a boogeyman to Americans. You know, they, they just have such a negative association with Stalin. You don't even have to make an argument. You know, you just got to say like, uh, Oh, you like Stalin. Don't you know he's Stalin? Like, okay, why is he bad? He killed people. He's Stalin. I just explained to you how he didn't intentionally kill people. Yeah, but he's still bad. Stalin. Saying Stalin has become an argument in America. I'm Cuban. Oh, are you are you typing this from Cuba right now, or are you Cuban American? Uh, we'd be speaking German if it wasn't for him. Darn right. Ask a Russian. Yeah, there you go. There's a reason the majority of Russia supports uh, Stalin now, because he turned them into an industrial superpower and defeated the Yahtzees when every Western analyst was saying that Russia would probably lose. Trotsky's theory, was the uh, theory, <laughs> theory, <laughs> Trotsky's theory, Trotsky's karaoke was mediocre at best. Yeah, I agree. He was terrible at karaoke. No, <laughs> Trotsky's theory was mediocre at best, at best, at its very best. Um, some might say his theory totally sucked and you should throw it out. Um, some might say, uh, some might say that Trotsky was a conspirator in a plot to overthrow the Soviet government, which he um, was in the in cahoots with Nazis in order to carry out. Some might say. Trotsky was an agent of the West. See, some might say that. Some might. <sighs> Trotsky would have conquered the United Kingdom, France, and Spain. Stalin didn't have the balls. For sure. Trotsky was literally arguing that the, the Soviet Union shouldn't fight the Yahtzees. When they were invading um, France or Poland or the other countries in Europe, because Trotsky was like, these aren't socialist countries, so therefore we shouldn't help them and just allow Hitler to ravage them. And that's where Stalin really hammered out uh, Marxism and the national question, this idea of Marxists supporting uh, people's right to national sovereignty before, you know, even even the class struggle, because the class struggle needs to take place on a national basis. Um, it needs to be class struggle within a, a country or a republic. Um, so therefore, you need to support self-determination first and therefore support the anti-colonial struggles in the global south that were rampant at the time or going on at the time. Um, and then Trotsky was arguing, no, just permanent revolution. We're just going to be in a constant state of warfare. We're going to export revolution. You know, we're going to allow Hitler to take over countries if those countries aren't socialist enough. Like, this is just absurd. Trotsky was just mad he could never take power. Um, so wrote whatever was convenient for him. He was just the perfect example of an opportunist. Stalin support Israel, though, kind of cringe. I don't know enough about that. Uh, Thomas Riggins wrote an article 
And I'm pretty sure his whole point was that the Soviet Union supported Israel too much and to the point of even supporting the creation of his. I don't want to say that, actually, because I don't know that that's what his argument was. I can't remember. I just remember Twitter got was in a tizzy about it. Um, but yeah, and, and China trades with Israel today, which um, the Palestinian activists still love China, right? And they say solidarity with China. China helps us out. China's anti-imperialist. Um, but yeah, they'd still do trade with Israel. But that's just because they have a trade policy of mutual development and a trade policy of complete non-interventionism. So they'll trade with anyone. But I don't know. There's a big, big part of me that wishes they would just be like, nope. We're not trading with you. You're an imperialist apartheid state. We're a socialist state. We're not trading with people who kill Palestinians. Which maybe China will do in the future now that they don't have to, now that the U.S. is just being openly hostile towards them. Um, Stalin was a master of mutual aid. He believed he could turn Israel socialist and facilitate a revolution for Palestinians. It's well documented. Interesting. Well, see, this is why I didn't talk about it because I don't know enough. Um, I don't know enough about what was going on at the time. I don't even know enough about the creation of Israel um, compared to what I know about the, the occupation and the apartheid, basically since the U S took over um, rather than the British Commonwealth. Um, being the main supporters and backers of Israel. It took me decades to catch up with Parenti on the subject of Stalin. Yeah, I mean, there's still those figures who, like, um, the propaganda is so intense. It takes a lot of reading and a lot of study to actually overcome, you know, sort of those propaganda myths that have been implanted in your head and actually start defending some of these figures like Stalin. And one for me was the DPRK, North Korea. And, and really, I launched myself into studying the DPRK in China um, at the beginning of my Marxist journey, um, just because I wanted to know what they were and why the Western Marxists dismissed them, how the Western Marxists could say, you know, China's not really Marxist, the DPRK is not really Marxist. Um, and then I also wanted to find out you know, I thought those countries were authoritarian dictatorships. You know, I believe the U.S. media and, and, you know, every U.S. media outlet said the same thing about them. I'm like, they can't all be lying to me. You know, but once you once you investigate and you realize how crappy the American bourgeois media actually is um, and you see how they lie and, and you really, you know, deeply go into the history of the DPRK in China, it becomes hard not to support them, right? <clears throat> Once you realize their actual struggle against imperialism and, and capitalism outside of the bourgeois lies. Um, but it takes a lot of research to get there, right? You actually have to do the research. There's not many people, you know, even though this is what people say about MLs, you know, they say like MLs just want to be edgy. You know, they spend all day on Reddit and that's why they defend Stalin. It's like, no, it's not fun to defend Stalin. It's not easy to defend Stalin. And nobody's going to be compelled in the West to defend Stalin unless they do a bunch of research on Stalin and they have feel, you know, actually feel like they have a real reason to defend him. Um, so MLs are usually the people who have actually investigated the primary sources, who are actually skeptical of the American media um, and actually do the work of, of researching these things and, and debunking the propaganda and deconstructing the propaganda. Stalin robbed a bank. You're darn right. Eddie, would you ever go on Revolutionary Blackout Network? I have been in contact with Nick, uh, Socialist MMA. I want to go on their show as soon as possible, but I'm going to be gone next week in North Dakota. So not next week. But All right, y'all. We've been grinding. We've been going for two and a half hours. This is a really, really fun stream. Um, thank you all for being here. We were over like we were somewhere in between 80 and 120 viewers the whole time. Um, freaking awesome these streams are getting more viewers which is really exciting for carlos and i really encourages us to come back appreciate all the the financial support or donations that we got from people those super super stickers or super chats if you want to support us long term midwestern marks dot or uh, patreon.com slash midwestern marks um but yeah thank you all for being here organize your workplace organize your community spread socialist education solidarity forever give a flex on the solidarity peace peace much love